Hello, everybody. <laughs> Dear students, invited speakers, faculty, guests and global audience watching us online, uh, we are delighted to welcome you to the 2023 edition of Lund Architecture Symposium, uh, LAS 23. My name is uh, Per Johan Dahl. I'm an architect and I'm head of department uh, here at the Lund University. And uh, I'm proud this year to open this event together with uh, Dorte Buboyesen, the CEO of Foreman Design Center in Malmö. Welcome, Dorte. Thank you very much, Per Johan, and thank you for inviting me on stage for this short welcome to Lars 23, <laughs> celebrating Urson in the contemporary and focusing on U UIA mm -hmm. 23. U utilizing uh, European Bauhaus's three concepts. Mm, yeah. Really important mm. for us. Mm. So uh, the Lund Architecture Symposium is an annual event here at the department. It's organized by the Department of Architecture and the Built Environment at Lund University in Sweden. And uh, the purpose is to identify contemporary uh, tendencies within architecture discourse and make those tendencies accessible for uh, students and faculty at the department. And before we jumpstart uh, this day, this rather packed day of uh, talks and discussions and uh, things that will happen, I have some general information. Uh, first, I would like to thank our sponsors that made this event possible. Uh, it's Architect Sweden Scania. Sveriges arkitekt uh, Skåne. It's FOIA Architects. Uh, Architect Sweden, uh, Sveriges arkitekt. Uh, the city of Malmö and uh, the city of Lund, uh, Lunds kommun. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to pay our, my gratitude to our research assistant, Valentina uh, Rapanu, who has produced the graphics that you've all seen and uh, as well as to Helene Svenningson, who has coordinated and marketed this symposium. Thanks a lot. A fire exit, so I'm uh, obliged to point out <laughs> to you. And uh, I'm also obliged to inform you that this event is being recorded for archival and educational purposes. But this year's laws circulates around celebration. Today, when we are celebrating uh, women at the International Women's Day, we wanted to expand the context of celebration uh, due to the tremendous mobilization of architecture that will happen here in the region during 2023. Uh, this year, uh, Copenhagen has been named World Capital of Architecture by UNESCO. And due to this recognition, uh, we will experience a lot of initiatives on architecture uh, commencing both on the Danish and the Swedish sides of the Öresund. So during 2023, the Öresund region will turn into an epicenter of global debate on architecture's capacity to reimagine the transformation of society into sustainable living. Uh, and the main event that will happen this year uh, is the UIA World Congress Copenhagen uh, that will commence uh, the 2nd through the 6th of July uh, in Copenhagen. But on the Swedish side, we have the Foreman Design Center. Uh, in Malmö as a main node for interaction. So, Dorte, what will happen at Foreman Design Center here? Yes, that's going to be very interesting, but Pia Johan, allow me just to take two seconds or maybe two minutes to introduce Foreman Design Center because I think there are a lot of new uh, sort of students in the area not knowing what Form Design mm -hmm. Center is. Uh, Form Design Center is situated in the center of, of Malmö, and we are a leading platform for architecture, design, arts and craft in southern Sweden. And we are also an uh, open and inclusive venue uh, with the target to address a broad public of all ages. We have no entrance fee at all. At, at the same time, form a central hub for interaction with the public sector, with the industry and academia. Hmm. And through exhibitions, program activities, development projects, and cross-sectoral collaboration, the organization facilitates and strengthens the strategy for our subject field regionally, nationally, and internationally. And we have a history going back to 1964, 
And we are a non-profit uh, association uh, together with Svensk Form. And today we run with the support from the Ministry of Culture, the city of Malmö and Region Skåne. And since 2018, a Form Design Center was designated by the government as a national node uh, for the Swedish architecture policy, design living environment. And Form Design Center is also being appointed as an official partner in European Bauhaus uh, organization in 2021. Mm. So that's Form Design Center shortly. But what is happening uh, during sort of the uh, UIA? And we actually work on two tracks. We work on, on um, different uh, program formats during the conference on the 2nd to the 6th of July in Copenhagen. And then we are also working with the uh, Malmö municipality under the theme Malmö in the making, addressing both professionals, but also addressing the public during, uh, especially the September of 2023. We are, allow me two, say, two minute, more minutes, uh, Perion, because I think it's important to address that we at the UIA, uh, through a project that Form Design Center is running called Sustain Nordic, uh, addressing sustainable construction material and architecture, we are the dispatcher and coordinator body of the effort for a Nordic pavilion uh, in context uh, of the, uh, Bella, the conference, which is taking place at the Bella Center in Copenhagen. And we are addressing different focus. We are work in progress, I have to say, but we are working with the following themes, uh, material hierarchy, place-based design and architecture, the unheard voices in architecture, and also legislation for sustainable future. That's mm -hmm. what we're working on. Then at Form Design Center, during the whole period, we are addressing all the different uh, main exhibition where you are involved, mm -hmm. called uh, Play for Democracy. And we are also addressing different kind of uh, programs and, and uh, facilitates different kind of lectures during the whole period. Because mm -hmm. there's, in a way, a for before, during and after the conference. So mm. there's a lot of things are taking place. So I want you to keep an eye on uh, Malmö municipality is, is making an open call with the, on the 23rd of March, uh, taking place at, um, yeah, in Malmö. I, I, I have to uh, check that out. Uh, where they are addressing uh, under the theme My Malmö, they really want to bring a lot of uh, actors and stakeholders into the scene, uh, into the scene of, of, of this event in order to really reach out to the public discussing architecture. Hmm. Thank you, Dorothy. I keep an eye on Form and Design Center and the region during this year. Mm -hmm. uh, the UIA aims at making architecture a central tool in, in achieving the UN's 17 Sustainability Development Goals. And this aim correlates explicitly with the aim of the new European Bauhaus, uh, which frames the three concepts in architecture, sustainability, inclusion and aesthetics, as tools to, 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 to achieving uh, the objectives in, in the EU's uh, European Green Deal. And for last, we, this year we have used these three concepts as, as, as kind of um, as tools for discussions. Uh, can you just very, very briefly <laughs> tell us what the, what the new European Bauhaus is? Because I know you're a partner in the new European We Bauhaus. are a partner, yeah. absolutely. And we're also trying to figure out our role in that, and yeah. that does take time. But I see um, new European Bauhaus and the initiative from, from Ursula von der Leyen as a kind of a think action tank uh, in order to, to address uh, the creative initiative, breaking down the boundaries between science and technology, between art and culture, mm. and social structures, mm. in order to find solutions for the everyday problem. Yeah. And I think that's, that's where the new European Bauhaus purpose is to focus our conversation on the places we inhabit and our relation with the natural environment beyond built space. So that's really what it's all about, I think. No, thank you. It's an important initiative to keep an eye on. Yeah, and I, I think what, what is important uh, is that European Bauhaus in itself does not bring a lot of financial support, but they do provide uh, the financial uh, um, sort of support through 
innovative ideas and products through the, the ad hoc call. So, so one has to keep an eye on, on the European Bauhaus website in order to see what is actually uh, possible mm -hmm. uh, in order to collaborate uh, between uh, different countries, different institutions, different actors. So that's, that's a very important part, and there's a lot of possibilities, and I have to say, there's quite a lot of money in these uh, finance, by, by the, for instance, Horizon and, and Erasmus Plus and mm -hmm. so forth. So there's a lot of money to, to reach out for. Yes, so uh, keep an eye on the new European mm -hmm. Bauhaus, and for this year's uh, loss, we are using the new European Bauhaus as a framework for critical discussion on uh, the concepts and topics in architecture, so we, we kind of tap into this. Mm -hmm. um, so we are really proud here today to have four uh, practices with us uh, to help us think about uh, these things and talk about these things, uh, about architecture and our sustainable futures. And our guests are spanning the geographies from Chiang Mai in, 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 in Thailand uh, to Turin in Italy, Oslo in Norway, and of course Copenhagen, who is a kind of an object of celebration in terms of architecture this year. Um, the symposium day has been structured through one morning session and one afternoon session. Uh, while the morning session will focus on aspects of aesthetics and sustainability, the afternoon session will focus on inclusion and sustainability. And they may, of course, overlap a little bit, these concepts, but that's the kind of general organization that we've been working on. Uh, both sessions will conclude with a discussion. Uh, the morning session uh, will be moderated by faculty, Monica Jonsson and Elin Down. Uh, while the afternoon session will be transformed into an artwork by Sandy Hilal. You'll get more information about this later. Uh, we will not have any time for questions during or immediately after the lectures, but we invite all participants uh, to join the conversation by asking questions during the moderated sessions. So I urge, uh, encourage all students to write down your questions and, and, and uh, raise them uh, during the, the moderated discussions and join the conversation at that time. So now I would like to give the word to, to the moderators for the morning here, Monica Jonsson and Elin Down. Welcome. And thank you, Dorte. And have a very nice day. Mm -hmm. hmm. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm happy now to uh, present our first speaker, who is Michele Bonini. Uh, He's an architect and PhD, a professor in, of architecture and urban design, alongside being the rector's delegate for international relations with China and Chinese and Asian countries at the Politecnico di Torino. Uh, he was a visiting professor uh, at Tsinghua University uh, in Beijing during 2013 and 14, and a visiting scholar at the MIT in Boston. On behalf of the Politecnico di Torino, uh, he was the principal architect for the Shugang Visitor Center for the Olympic Winter Games in Beijing uh, last year, in collab with the Tsinghua University. Uh, your current research focuses on the innovation of design and its practices according to models of transnational exchange. Uh, you're the author of more than 350 scientific publications and several books. Your most recent book is The Story of a Section uh, Designing the Shugang Oxygen Factory, which we will hear more about yeah. right now. So please, let us welcome Michele to the stage with a warm hat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica, for uh, your introduction, and thank you for uh, your kind invitation to Lund University. I'm very happy to see this room uh, very full of people. Only one year ago was not that easy to have this situation, so I'm very happy again. And to see colleagues, architects, uh, but most of you are students. This is my first job, is teaching, so I'm happy to, to talk with students. But what I tell you about today is more focused on research, and Monica already mentioned a couple of points I will uh, um, discuss with you during this talk, that is the 
uh, involvement, uh, the very in incredible experience of being involved by our Chinese partners in Beijing, the Tsinghua University, in the design uh, of the for the Olympic Games, Winter Olympics uh, held one year ago in 2022. So this was not that usual for a European university to have a task of uh, design in real uh, projects, but this was a very interesting opportunity also because uh, of the outputs uh, of uh, more scientific research. The book that you mentioned is one example, I will tell you more about, uh, but was an overall opportunity to face architecture in a very practical way in the reflection after the project uh, and also, as uh, I will uh, tell you, as on a reflection on how academia and practitioners can work together to face this kind of very strategic uh, project. So I will divide uh, my presentation in these three steps. But first, uh, to start uh, a short introduction uh, about the topic, the context, that is uh, the area of Shugang that you see here in a picture around uh, 10 years ago. In 2006, uh, this big factory that was occupying uh, 9 million square meters, being one of the biggest uh, um, steel factories in the world was uh, moved uh, in the production to another site out of Beijing because of logistic and pollution problems. So the Summer Olympic were approaching in 2008, so the government decided to ask this state-owned company to find another place. So in a couple of years, uh, Beijing found uh, itself with a new area, a big area, to transform again into a new part of the city. What is interesting is that, uh, as you can see from this picture that is recent, uh, where uh, part of the transformation uh, uh, has already happened, the situation on site uh, belongs to the let's say, tradition of, of the so-called work units in China that was not uh, only about production, but about having in the same compound, of course, the factory as the main activity, but also you can see uh, many other, uh, there is a temple, there are housing, there are services, uh, the hospital, the schools, uh, so all the community of workers were living uh, on site. And so this was an interesting part uh, of the transformation project led by Tsinghua University and, and other Institute in, uh, in Beijing because the urban fabric was not only the big box of the factory, but a kind of mixed situation. So the, even if so big, uh, the idea of bringing back to the city this place was some way easier or more, more uh, appropriate in terms of uh, density and, and so on. So you, you see here a general situation of this place that is um, west of Beijing, so the, the city is, is ending uh, there, with the Olympic Committee, that was the first uh, renovation of the northern part, uh, and they settled down years ago to organize the, the Olympics. This is a, a big, uh, the Fornas Museum, some offices, uh, and over there, the site dedicated uh, to the Winter Olympic. It was uh, one of the two uh, urban sites for the Games uh, last uh, year. Uh, this place, uh, also behind the Olympics, uh, had a very re relevant word to launch uh, a discussion, a design discussion about uh, industrial renovation in China. This is a quite uh, a new topic. I remember when 10 years ago I was teaching, uh, as Monica said, in Tsinghua University, this was not a matter uh, of academic discussion, uh, of practice. Uh, was not yet uh, a focal point uh, for architects. Then uh, some policies, uh, and the main one <coughs> was this idea of uh, transforming cities, uh, moving uh, factories out of them, because uh, as you know, China is increasing a lot urban population, and so having together a strong density in of inhabitants plus production became impossible. So most of the, <coughs> at least the public factories uh, moved away. So, Imagine all cities in China found new places that before they were walled, they closed to the uh, population not belonging to the factory. And so in, uh, suddenly, in a few years, uh, this area and many others in China were uh, posing design questions to the architects and to the academic community. So while in, um, in Europe, 
at least in Italy is the situation I know better, we had a lot of years to develop an approach, a philosophy towards uh, industrial renovation, and we went through different phases. I remember in the 80s it was more about protection, because the, at that time the main idea was to demolish and make new buildings, while well, starting to reflect on which values were important for protection was a step-by-step uh, -step, uh, process, and then the reuse and different phases uh, along 40 years, uh, while uh, all of this happened in, in a very short uh, moment. And you can see from these images by several architects from China, like the first two, or from Europe, the others, uh, became a kind of uh, gym, a kind of experimental platform to uh, promote in a, a very intense, uh, very short time debate about what to do with uh, industrial regeneration. And I can see I, we were a, a small part of it, of course, but I can see that taking part uh, on this uh, very intense uh, experimentation on industrial renovation was very stimulating in, uh, in the last few years. So but, uh, the second part of this introduction is about how did it start? That was quite uh, strange. We invited uh, in 2016 uh, when Torino celebrated uh, 10 years uh, from the. Oh, sorry, I did. Uh, sorry for the technical inconvenience. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, Torino celebrated 10 years from the 2006 Winter Olympics. You may remember them. And uh, we invited a delegation from uh, Tsinghua plus Olympic Committee to visit Torino. And we were sure they were interested about uh, mountains, about ski, about winter sport in the mountains. That is not a uh, long tradition in China. So organized a three days program, all of it focused on uh, mountains. And, uh, but in some way, maybe they had already solved this problem. They already asked a suggestion to other countries or other uh, experts, and they were uh, uh, during their stay, they were impressed uh, and they want to visit uh, industrial sites. We were wondering why, what, what, does it, what is the relation between winter games and industrial site. We didn't know yet about Shugang, that Shugang was, was already selected uh, as the, one of the main Olympic sites. And so the last day, very fast, uh, we organized a couple of visits to these buildings. I, I quickly show to you because they are a good example of industrial renovation. This is the uh, well-known uh, uh, Lingotto factory built by Fiat in the, at the beginning of the last uh, century. A very long building is 600 meters, uh, admired by many architects, uh, also Le Corbusier. There is a picture with Le Corbusier on top of the, of the building, fascinated by this truck where it was possible to test cars uh, as soon they were produced. So the, imagine the production starting at the ground floor, and then there were many steps of construction, and then the top to the test uh, and, and go. So during uh, a process, I, I talked before uh, about a long time in, uh, in Europe, uh, it lasted uh, from the competition to the completion almost 25 years. Renzo Piano transformed the overall factory with uh, you, you see at the beginning this was out of the city in the countryside this was the condition of the neighborhood uh, in the recent years so the challenge in the competition wa was how to make this building that is the opposite of what we said about chinese work unit this building is a is one block with no other function than production so there was a a very strong boundary between the the urban fabric and the city and uh, the block of the building is the opposite that the work unit where these two elements were some way mixed. And so the, the strategy uh, by Renzo Piano was to some way break up the, this big volume and transform in a number of small activities, uh, smaller activities that combine all together, make the program of a small neighborhood or a small city. You see there are, there are the hotel, the university, cinema, museum, commercial area, hotel, residence, and, and much more. So in, in one building, many, many buildings. And so if you follow the building through its cross sections, you, you can find these smaller spaces that are 
easy to use from the city, from the infrastructure, from the neighborhood, and so on. This is the, our school of architecture, where we do classes also per year. As a visiting professor, did studios in this venue. And these are the uh, in a city, squares, garden uh, are included. Uh, you can see on the first floor, now it's closed by glass, so it's a pity because this public street uh, uh, intended by Renzo Piano to be an open air street, uh, like a portico, and uh, having shops uh, and different urban activities, now it's closed, but this is the idea, to bring the city inside the big uh, building. And then uh, to the top, uh, recently the track was transformed into a garden, but the idea is to use also the, la la the upper floor for uh, cultural activities. There is a conference room uh, and a museum in, on the top. The second uh, building we, we were uh, uh, visiting with our Chinese uh, colleagues uh, was not a building actually, was the renovation of some buildings to be transformed into a park by Peter Latz, the German landscape architect who was uh, in charge of uh, transforming this big platform or factory, it was con totally covered by roof uh, of uh, production, uh, into a park in, a, in a northern Torino, where a lot of new housing was built around. This became a park for the community, a big one. So most of the strategy is about reducing the density of the city, just leaving some of the relics of the of the um, factory to give a rhythm, to give a more human scale to the single spaces. And what uh, you, you see more, more uh, points of this park, this is a church designed by Mario Botta at the same time, at the same uh, period. But the most uh, impressive space and what uh, was very interesting in the view of uh, Chinese uh, colleagues uh, is this space, uh, keeping the the roof of the main factory and having this big uh, park, bi this big plaza to make sport, to stay together. And it is a very attractive place for citizens, as you can see from this picture. So thi this was some way the bridge between, uh, uh, we understood that, that day in 2016, between what uh, we could some way represent, offer as a skills, as an expertise in Torino, industrial renovation, and what uh, the Chinese committee was needed. And so a few months later, they proposed to us a very similar building. This is still before transformation, where it was a completely closed building, part of the Shugang factory, to be transformed into the visitor center for this uh, Olympic venue. So just at the entrance of the site where people can go through and find uh, services, shop, uh, the press offices, uh, and conference hall, and so on. So this was the challenge they face to us, they invited, uh, in, in China it's very typical to have models, to have analogies, so it's the uh, idea of the copy that uh, in our, uh, often in our uh, uh, perception is always a, a negative uh, point of Chinese culture. They copy products, they copy everything from us, but it's a very sophisticated uh, idea for in Chinese culture. So the idea of starting from models, like uh, in this case, the project by Peter Lutz was a kind of a starting point of the entire project. So this is the first part, I go quickly through the three of them, that is pure design. So the uh, real design, we were involved working together with Tsinghua University. So the, the condition before um, the start of transformation was this, you can see our building, this uh, yellow green building in the middle of a very dense uh, industrial area to be transformed in the venue for uh, ski, the big air uh, and the freestyle, so to discipline with snowboard and ski, in, uh, so a, a big ski jump uh, has been built, as you remember from one of the first, first slides. And so we, we started to think about this uh, building with the clear request by the Chinese uh, committee to create the, the same feeling of um, the, the factory in Torino, so a big uh, space for uh, open space for welcoming people. But at the same time, they said, okay, we want also 10,000 square meters of activities for the program of the building. So that was a little bit strange because in Torino, the, the volume is totally empty in this, uh, in this uh, case. So 
we worked, as you can see in this section, on the idea of having a ground floor totally free with uh, some structural decisions that make the building some way suspended and uh, all the program from the second floor up to the, to the roof. So this is a axonometry of the design. You can clearly see the three levels, the so-called playground, that is the red one, very near to the ticket office that is over there and people go in to, to go to the to see the races and uh, find this uh, protected but open space to relax to spend some time uh, before the, the race and so on then this uh, glass box uh, is suspended also structurally suspended and uh, then there are some little glass house uh, kind of uh, meeting rooms or vip rooms to see the um, competitions from very few meters because the, as you will see, the sky jump is uh, nearby. So this is the building without uh, the top part. So we we'll see this space uh, is uh, is safe for the public. Only six uh, points, so six, six feet uh, are touching ground, containing staircases and small shops, uh, and then all the rest of the volume is suspended to to in a cantilever to this uh, structure. We never had, uh, because of the COVID, real final picture, but this you can feel some way a part of the, this under, under uh, roof space for the public. And uh, this is a section highlighting these three levels of the building. And this is a, a short video I showed to you. We did it uh, not much for architects, but for our community of students, uh, about engineering, architecture, and whatever, to show the collaboration with Chihuahua. to keep the building suspended. Okay, some almost final pictures just to give you an idea with the sky jump just a few meters away. And uh, um, last to conclude this first part, what we what was more interesting for us in this project? As I said before, it's unusual. So we, we are not a professional practice. We don't do design, we do research. So in this uh, opportunity, it was a little strange. We had to do some change in our structure to face this challenge. But we, I, wa I want to say that there were two things that wa were very interesting. Maybe not that much the final result. Uh, as you could see from the picture, we, we lost a little bit the, the control. We, it was not totally, uh, the design was not totally followed during the construction. The COVID arrived, uh, um, brought us away from the, from the site, but it's not a, a problem. We, two things. One is, is this. So the, um, the building was very central. This is the, from the TV during the Olympics uh, and was one of the protagonists of a very intense debate. Uh, every day where uh, many posts were published uh, in many sites and blogs uh, about uh, the meaning of having uh, sport races, winter games uh, in such uh, industrial pl plant. This, uh, this uh, scenario, remember, like a nuclear plant. Uh, many said uh, it's totally dystopian. You put some snow in a small part and all the rest is very gray, it's very industrial. So no, no way to convince us that is a good site for uh, Olympics. While another part said uh, this is very inspiring because uh, uh, using for uh, big events, uh, existing structure, no matter if they are industrial or whatever, is a very sustainable approach because uh, represent the 
idea, the ambition of reusing something already existing instead of producing big building. The 2008, China was a lot criticized because of the very unsustainable approach of the, that Olympics, the Summer Olympics, uh, where they spent uh, three times that they planned uh, building the big, uh, the big stadium, uh, the water cube, and many other venues, very expensive. So this time, uh, in our output, uh, for by the, uh, our input from the client at the beginning was, uh, we have to show also in the television uh, that we are sustainable, uh, trying to reuse uh, as much as possible. So this factory we started is not a, a historical factory. It was built in 86, very recent, uh, no historical value, but. Um, sy symbolically, the idea of this and many other around the factory to be reused was to transmit to the world uh, debate, the world audience, this idea of sustainability. The, the second point, and uh, I, this is also my second point of the presentation, is about research. So the, in China, uh, we had a quite uh, a 10 years experience of academic research before this, uh, and we noticed that it's very difficult to get sources, to get information. Uh, as architects, to get a map uh, of a part of the city you would like to study is almost impossible. While in this case, uh, having a very concrete, a very pragmatic uh, goal of contributing to a real project, uh, the Chinese col colleagues uh, disclosed to us uh, much more uh, materials than usual. So these eight months in, in design were uh, more uh, rich of information, knowledge, understanding of the Chinese context that 10 years before was an incredible opportunity of knowledge and research. So during we, we were expecting this. Uh, so during the process, uh, we gathered together and we dedicated one PhD student. So this is a also a very positive condition of university that I'm not sure that a practice uh, talking about budget can put one person full time to study the archive. It's not maybe uh, possible with the um, logic of the practice of the business. Well, a university is more easy. Uh, so um, a PhD student, uh, she's studying since three years this process as she contributed Camilla Forina to the book as well. And this was the entire archive during the eighth month of design production. So we, uh, we put together and we said, what do we do with that? And so after uh, the end of the, of the process of design, we talk uh, among us, uh, also involving other researchers. We started uh, from this uh, reflection by Bruno Latour and Albena Ianeva, I know she also was teaching here in Lund. They, they are working a lot on the so-called artwork network theory, so following processes, being like ethnographers studying the practice during its process, not only as a final product of design. And so they, they said in an article they published a few years ago, just before our project, to consider a building only as a static object uh, will be like gazing endlessly at a ghoul high in the sky without being able ever to capture how it moves. So they, they say some way that uh, talking about uh, a project uh, only looking to the final output, the color picture on the magazine, is not the way to consider architecture because life uh, of each building is a process, of course, before the construction and during the construction, but also after it because everything is going to change. In our case, uh, after the game, the function of the building completely change and is still uh, transforming. So like in, uh, in uh, this case, that if you want to fix at a moment the, um, where uh, uh, will be a, a, a goal like this, uh, you have to start before, you have to follow this movement so way. They also make the comparison with a gun, uh, if you want to, uh, it's not uh, that nice, but if you want to take uh, a birth, uh, you have to understand uh, its trajectory. You cannot uh, fix it in this certain moment. And so this, uh, this kind of uh, criteria brought us uh, to study the building as something moving, something always uh, in its process. Uh, we realized we, during these eight months, we produced more than 300 uh, sections. The cross section is some way the main uh, 
design product because of this uh, serial uh, organization of the building. This was when we demolished the facades uh, and we could see this uh, seriality. And uh, around the section we collect, uh, we started to put uh, which other documents from that archive we could have at the same moment. So this was the starting point of reconstructing the design process through this uh, diagram that uh, put uh, as in the middle, this is the China room that was the research team of Politecnico di Torino working on the project with some colleagues, uh, some 40 colleagues of the department uh, represent, helping us in the technology, structure and so on. On this side, uh, the Chinghua group and on the other side, the clients. So you can see each, uh, each of the section is uh, in a uh, it's possible to click on this diagram and each uh, document, uh, WeChat or PDF or whatever is opening. So you can see the archive uh, during the uh, building uh, design. And so this was the basis uh, of the book that was mentioned before and was a, a kind of second project. So we started to work on this book during the pandemic with more time and we, we published recently. I will leave also a copy here for, uh, for you. Uh, these were some of the pages. You can see always uh, to top right uh, the section changing during the process uh, and uh, a text uh, following very carefully the process of design based uh, on uh, objectivity are not about reflection or, or poetics of the design, but uh, all the procedure that make the project uh, try to make the project efficient, to try to, to the, make the transformation uh, real, and so going towards the final uh, drawings. Uh, this second project brought to us uh, uh, an important reflection that was uh, for the first time here, and then we are continuing with other Chinese partners or with Tsinghua, we were invited to design. That is not our main, main job. So. Mm, Many of us did it uh, in the practice, uh, did it uh, in some uh, cases out of university, but never in the university. So in this uh, case, uh, we worked uh, in a strange way. We did a small team uh, with PhD students that were, work were working uh, daily. And then every week, uh, we invited professors from the faculty, from the department to contribute. So with sketches, with very informed, and then uh, again, the team uh, took all of them and implemented the project and then opening again the group. And, and that worked, but was not the, something sustainable forever because in that period, in those months, these PhD students totally stopped their research. They, they did their the thesis uh, later, so it's a problem. So starting from this uh, experience, uh, we tried uh, to set up, uh, and this is the third part of the presentation, a new formula, a new idea, that is a project we also agreed, we put to, uh, uh, together with the Ordine degli Architetti, the Architects Association in Torino, to join forces. So we, we were inspired by China, where Design Institute uh, working on, the, for instance, on the Master Plan on the Olympics, are, you can imagine 1,000 people some of them are professors or researchers that uh, in the afternoon, after class, go there and do real design together with uh, many people hired uh, as practitioners. Uh, they do that full time uh, designing for the university in the design institute. So in order to be closer to them and to be more able to work with them, with the design institute in China, but this was an inspiration. Then we, we are open also to other countries. But the starting point was this. Uh, we decided to uh, merge practice and research. And so we did a number, at, at the moment, two different teams uh, with researchers and practitioners together. We did a public call. And so for China in 2021, uh, some 35, 40 offices, most of them very young, answered the call. The best 12 joined the team. And so the China Room and these 12 practice did a joint team to be some way competitive in the Chinese market, working with universities. And for us, it was 
is still a great advantage because you can imagine that a Chinese university, this kind of practical activity represents a uh, well, lot of the budget, but also half of the activity. So we were working with Chinese uh, university since 10 years, but always knowing and working with half of them, never opening the doors of the Design Institute. And we discover uh, a big, uh, a different way to do research in a practical way. And now we are 100% partner. Also Chinese partners feel as closer to them. And for the, for the practitioners that are most of them very young, and in Italy uh, offices are typically small, three pairs or four people, they have no energy to to start to work in the Chinese market because it's big, it's complicated. And so thanks to the Polito relations in China, they can work in China. So it's a kind of win-win combination that is working well. And then uh, more recently, we opened a second team under the same principle in uh, Latin America. But the last part is an uh, experiment we did for, with this team, this uh, practice and academic team. We, at the end, at the present moment, we did already three projects with, in this combination, and they are working quite well. I, I, we are satisfied. But this is a more cultural project uh, as a kind of test of this cooperation. And we were invited as Polito to be part of the last uh, Shenzhen Biennale that happens every two years uh, in, the, in Shenzhen, that is one of the biggest city of the greater Bay area, south of China, where Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Dongguan, Guangzhou, Foshan, and Macau are located. So 70 million people uh, living in a very dense area. So the Biennale was born uh, 15 years ago to some way get ideas and support from the world to face this very, this incredible urban condition. So um, um, a real company called GD Land asked us to focus on three sites. They are specialized in the transformation of uh, industrial sites in, uh, in China, industrial and infrastructural sites. And so they said uh, to, to, uh, to our team, together with South China University of Technology, that is another partner, what uh, you would like to propose for these three very different sites uh, in the Greater Bay Area. And so we, we were working in, uh, we took uh, the size, we divided in a smaller part with the idea of involving the architects, the practitioners of uh, Polito Studio, that is the initiative I told you before. So we, we were uh, obtaining nine small uh, parts, 200 meters for 200 meters, and we inspired uh, from uh, Roma Interrotta, that was an, an exhibition promoted in Rome in seven, 1978, and maybe some of you remember again in 2008 uh, in the Biennale di Venezia, they, they re-exhibited the same initiatives. And this idea was to invite, uh, in this case, 12, they were big architects, uh, not uh, like young uh, Torino architects, they were uh, Robert Venturi, James Stirling, Aldo Rossi, the, uh, Bob Creer, uh, and many others, so very important architects at that time. And the curator started from the map uh, drawn by Gian Battista Nolli at the mid of the uh, 18th century, uh, where, where we, in a very innovative way, he designed black and white, where white were the street, of course, the square street, the open air public space, but also the interior of the church, the internal courtyards of the palaces. So all what that space is that in some cases can become a public area. And so this, this was very famous and used by the city of Rome for centuries as a main map of the city center. But the principle of the curator was Rome stopped, interrupted his real quality urban development in that century, the 18th century, with the Baroque plans of Rome, and then became a matter of expanding the city without uh, quality, just uh, receiving a lot of population and losing this kind of control of the urban fabric that was uh, at its best uh, during the 18th century. So the curator stopped Roma in, uh, uh, at the mid of the 18th century and asked 12 architects to design a new Rome into the Nolli map. 
so doing contemporary projects in that condition. So I make a kind of step of 250 years. Well, in our case, we did a strange operation, an ideal operation, putting together the three sites and asking uh, our invited architect to do the opposite some way. We call it uh, GBA, Greater Bay Area Uninterrupted, asking to work instead on the continuity, on the stratification of the transformation. So we, we believed that in this spa space of the Greater Bay Area, where new urbanization happens very fast uh, with tabula rasa operation and very rapid transformation, looking for continuity instead of breaking of the, of the transformation was the, the key point of this. So we put together the nine architects and uh, we asked them to create a scenario, a design strategy for transforming this site through uh, studying the change in the last 20 years. So you can see that in 20 years, that is a short time, uh, this space is totally changed in density, in uh, the typologies and so on. And then, so we put all the, the three layers together in a kind of archaeological map, and we ask it to do a transformation in section considering this kind of uh, overlapped context. And so this was our way to see that this transformation is uh, uninterrupted. All the parts uh, existing in different years uh, are coming together to say, let's try to keep uh, the memory and the continuity of the transformation of this, this space. So this, the next, maybe it's a little bit heavy. Okay, this was the section produced by the architect. You will see more into detail, but you can imagine that each part was designed by one uh, office under uh, some guidelines, and then they coordinate in order to do uh, one, only one section. This was the structure, Polito and the Architectural Association, creating the project I mentioned Polito Studio that created a kind of spin-off uh, composed by 12 uh, offices. Uh, only nine uh, took part to this initiative, but they are all of them active. Plus China Room, plus University Research. And so Turing Design Hub was the participant to the Biennale with the China Room as a curatorial team and the exhibitors producing each of them a part of this uh, section based on continuity of the public space and continuity in time. So you can see them, all of them working uh, on this uh, big drawing with a very simple design uh, on two levels with the, all the explanation I told you here. And then uh, if you go up by this staircase, you find this nine meter section rotating uh, the, the people can interact uh, and see the overall section, while you, here you find the archaeological map uh, and all the interviews to the architects. This is uh, during the Biennale that is ongoing, is still uh, in Shenzhen till uh, end of March. And with this uh, last uh, video showing the project, uh, this will be also my conclusion. You can this. Here is where uh, the different offices divide, but they, they try to unify. Yesterday, now, tomorrow. Innovation and tradition. City of continuous flow in space and time. Thinking soil consumption. Above, on, and below the ground. Positive heritage, future. The adaptive change of places through time. Give space to agriculture and nature. The goal of expanding societies and cities in harmony with the environment. Discover beauty. Uninterrupted public space links the different parts of a city. Rich urban environment where the new and the old coexist. New forms of gaze. Restarting from emptiness. Connections, nature. Nature evolves through time, shaping space. Be like a forest of 60,000 trees. Okay. 
thank you very much and I will be ready to answer your question later in, in the discussion. Thank you. Yes. yes, we would uh, now like to welcome our next speaker, which is the Norwegian practice Mantecula. It is Beate Holmbeck and Per Thomsen. They founded it in 2004. Uh, I believe it's Beate who will mainly speak today, but we will meet Per later in the panel discussion. Uh, Holmbeck is a graduate from the Oslo School of Architecture and Design, where she now holds a professorship. Thompson is a graduate from Lund University. Mantecula's productions, they span from ideal and explorative projects to public commissions. Uh, the office works at the intersection of art, architecture and landscape architecture, and they, spe uh, they pay special attention to site, concept, form, construction and narrative. Their work is widely published, represented in exhibitions and acquired by international architecture collections. Projects by Mantecula have been nominated for the EU Mayas Awards in 2009, 11, 18 and 20. Recently, both Holmbeck and Thompson received the prestigious Prince Eugene Medal for Outstanding Artistic Achievements. Welcome, Beate. Thank you uh, for the introduction uh, and for inviting us here. It's a, it's a pleasure. <laughs> I'll try to uh, speak louder than the neighboring room. <laughs> um, we will simply show some projects we've done. Um, uh, I'll try to talk about uh, how we give form and structure to space and ideas. But before uh, I do that, I'd like to just introduce a few concepts that are important to us. I will read some very, very short texts. The concept of time is overwhelming. These beautiful sensuous forms are expressions of geological times. Uh, manifestations like these that are not result of will but of natural phenomena are inspirational to us because they have evolved and lasted in full integrity through time. Nature, what is so powerful in this group, is not the brutality of the decapitation, but the fact that these trees will continue to live and even take on new forms. Um, in a time where the world might not longer be as we know it, this group is a reminder of life's capability of development and adaption. Imagination. In one of his memos for the next millennium, the Italian writer Italo Calvino says, fantasy is a place where it rains. The text is a warning against the loss of a basic human faculty. Imagination's power to bring visions into focus with eyes closed. We think that being able to envision places and spaces that does not yet exist is important and necessary. As architects, we can long for such places and hopefully bring them into existence. Construction. This was not designed by architects. However, I'm sure there were constraints that had to do with reduction of cost, availability of material and limitation of labor. The result demonstrates characteristics that we appreciate in a construction. There is a visible and understandable structural order. Light is where there is no structure. There is a logic to what kind of timber is used where. And the measurements and proportions of the space derives from the materials in use. And the last one, matter. 
Making is about bringing something into, the, into being, and as such, leaving a mark. Building is a positive act. By adding one material to another, we confirm our presence in the world. The way a material ages, its strength, how it looks and feels, and what emotions it evokes is important. We hope it will still be possible to consider these aspects of a material in the years to come. Some time ago, we visited the town hall in the Danish city of Aarhus from 1942, designed by Arne Jacobsen and Erik Möller. The floors of the central halls are bog oak, pieces of 7,000-year-old timber that was dug up from precious peat bog. How are we to think about this? Then to the projects. We, uh, most of our projects are in Norway. Uh, they are small. Lots of them are about practical infrastructural topics. Um, uh, whether they're relevant, you will have to tell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first project, actually I, I have um, six projects um, in the presentation, maybe there's only time for five, we will see. Uh, the first project is um, a ferry stop up north in, uh, uh, along the coast in Norway. Uh, the client was the, the National Scenic Route, it's a state initiative that uh, that sort of builds infrastructure along roads that are traveled by tourists. Uh, this is uh, not the site, it's across the bay from the site. Uh, it's one of Norway's smallest communities. Uh, you cannot get here unless you travel by boat. The boats were getting too small for the increased number of cars and tourists and one had to move the, the ferry stop. The white house that you see here is a small hotel. The yellow house is supposedly um, at least Norway's most northern coffee brewery. They were of course concerned uh, when one decided to move uh, the ferry stop across the bay to this site, which is a beautiful natural site. Um, we were asked to to first only look at the at the sort of how the parking area and traffic area was placed in the on the site and then we were asked to design a, a small service building uh, the top model is the existing situation the bottom model is the our suggested uh, project actually where is this long <laughs> Um, so this plan is quite different from what was suggested by the road ministry, um, trying to take or to, to keep more of the sort of natural coastline. Uh, what I will talk about is, is this building placed at the very end of the, of the traffic area. We designed it as a, uh, as a transparent building with a large roof. Uh, creating some outdoor areas and some indoor areas, uh, but making it uh, as transparent as possible so that you actually could th see through the building over to the small community on the other side of the bay. Um, we had this idea about a large volume, a large body, maybe inspired by boats, large ships, or by creatures in the sea. Um, so the roof structure is this um, upside-down vault spanning between two in-situ concrete gable va walls. Here's the model. We work a lot in model. With, um, I think that's important to say also to students. Models are the closest you can get to a building <laughs> before you build. Uh, 
we often work with a sort of self-imposed constraints, um, setting ourselves some goals or premises for what we do. Um, our goal here was to, as I said, make a transparent building, but also actually being able to see every part of the structure. Um, we are uh, the way we work is uh, is not creating very delicate, sort of fine things. They are often quite crude, but we are interested in in in, in structures and buildings where you actually can understand what you see. So the um, the building is uh, contains of a of a kiosk and covered outdoor waiting area and an insulated waiting area and a, and a toilet and another covered area, outdoor area. Uh, there's a lot of waiting time for ferries um, and you spend a lot of time in your car or in the waiting room. If you smoke or if you want to be outside, it's nice to get cover for the rain or snow. Uh, final building. I will not go into detail talking about the buildings. There's not time to do so. I can say that the, the main part of the contract here was the groundwork. So the contractor had never built the building before. So every piece is prefabricated and mounted together on the site. Uh, it was important for us to be able to see the vault from every room, as you can see here. Uh, and every detail is indeed visible. Another project from the or for the scenic route, a rest area, a little bit, uh, well, in the Lofoten Islands, known to many. Uh, the sites we have been working on for for the scenic route are not really picturesque landscape sites. They are often sort of um, leftover sites from uh, from infrastructure from the road works. Uh, so was the case with this. It was an existing rest stop built on a on a deposit site along the coast. Uh, the rest stop needed transformation, and we were asked to 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 do the project. Um, here's the model. Um, uh, it's a beautiful view from this place. Um, it's a place where people gather during New Year's Eve. Uh, in the in the summertime to have campfires, etc. Uh, we wanted to give them a large sort of viewing platform from where they could look uh, on the on the fjord. Um, and of course, also we wanted to, that was for the locals, also for the tourists. We wanted to give them a place where they could drink their coffee and eat their the food they had brought with them. So we reduced the traffic area. Um, Planted local, local um, trees, small bushes, not very much grows in this place, uh, and worked on the layout of the of the platform. But actually, what we worked the most with uh, was um, the tables, the groups where you could sit uh, and drink your coffee. Um, it's nice when you come to a place like this that you can find your your sort of own your own group, that you can feel that you own this place for a little while. So we wanted to make all the places different. So we decided, we spent a lot of work on these benches and tables and pieces of furniture. Uh, another self-imposed constraint was that um, the tables and benches should not be self-supportive. They should only have two legs each. Um, here and here, and then the last and important support should be in the railing. Uh, this this gave us some some forms or, and some uh, geometry to work with, and from this geometry we developed um, a pattern. Every point in the triangular form forms point to to a structural element, and then we developed a sort of palette. From the from the semaphore system, working with very very clear colors, um, that we could um, so that we could paint and and cast in polyurethane 
these seats and tabletops so that they would be a bit warmer to sit on and to touch than if they were all steel. So here are the 32 different pieces uh, all working together. Um, here are some images from from the site. The surface of the of the composite is incredibly shiny. So, in addition to the patterns and the colors of the of the surfaces, you also got, get this reflection of the changing sky, which is quite nice. Yeah, here is the final place. Uh, oops, I do the same thing as you did. <laughs> um, in addition to working with commissions, ever since uh, before 2000, we have worked with sort of self-initiated paper projects, projects that are not intended to be built, but that are uh, explorations of, of topics that we're interested in. Um, so, so now, if we get an invitation to take part in an exhibition or a biennale or, or something like that, we, we often use the possibility to, to develop a project like that. And the project I'm showing now is, uh, is done um, for, um, for the Frax uh, Center in, in Orlea. They, they commissioned us to do a project that they could have in their uh, collection. They have a very large collection of sort of experimental architecture. They were having a, a biennale, and, and the topic of the biennale was walking through someone else's dream. It was, uh, we were sort of given free hands uh, to, to do whatever we wanted with that title. Um, and, and we really wanted to do um, architectural projects. So we started to think about how, what does it mean to walk through someone else's dream? Who, who is dreaming? Uh, what kind of dreams are we, are we working with here? So then we decided to, to search for uh, narratives or stories about historic uh, characters that have been isolated, thinking that if you live in isolation, your dreams must be important, because then your dream is somehow what gives you impulses. So we identified five, five characters uh, uh, throughout history, throughout ge or throughout geography, uh, that have uh, lived in extreme isolation. And we started to, to think about what they might have been dreaming of. Um, and, and to make the, the story even tighter, we decided that a criteria for choosing a, a character had to be that the isolation happened on an island, that they were really isolated on an island. Uh, so these are, are five, uh, five islands you cannot read, I'll, I'll tell you in a second, uh, all in the same scale. Uh, we also <coughs> had another sort of constraint, and that was that the projects were going to be developed from some um, leftover oak that we were given by some, yeah, somebody building close to, to the, our office. So we de decided to build five sites. Each site should have the measurements of one measuring unit used by the time, or at the time of the protagonists in the countries of the protagonists. So I'll go very quickly through the five projects. Uh, another criteria we had was that the, the, the project had to be developed on one sheet of paper. So the, the design was, was made on one large sheet of, of paper, and then we built the model. So this is based on the story of Greta Osmundsen, an Icelandic arson in the 11th century, who was outlawed. Um, he spent five years on the on Drangey Island because before he was killed as an outlaw, anyone can kill you. So we believed that he must have had dreams of fear and freedom, and a need to be in control. So 
to the building is a simple. Yeah, I can also say that the measurement of the site is one aln, 62.7 centimeters squared. Uh, a platform uh, with openings in every cardinal directions and a sort of central space um, from where you you are hidden and from where you can escape if someone gets close. The next project is based on the story of uh, Pietro Kolnyshevsky, a Ukrainian Cossack, who sort of fell out of grace um, and was sent to the Solovets Island in, in uh, Siberia, where he spent 37 years in an um, isolation cell. He was um, a warrior and a diplomat, and we think he must have dreamt of friction, and also uh, we believe he had a feeling of gratefulness. He decided to stay on in the cell when he was released. I keep forgetting, one arson is a Ukrainian measurement, 71.1 centimeters squared. And the site and the building, uh, two very, or one, one structure built of two spaces that share a sort of quite intricate structural system. The next character is Mary Mallon, uh, an Irish cook working in New York. She was the first known sort of unsymptomatic carrier of typhoid fever. She um, infected her guests. Some, ki some, were, some died, uh, some survived, but she was two times sentenced to isolation in North Brother Island, uh, where she spent altogether 29 years. We believe uh, the, the measurement here is one same, an Irish measurement, 62.5 centimeters. Um, we believe she must have dreamt of normality, and she must also have had a concern about surface. She never was ill herself, and one could not l see on her appearance that she was a carrier of a deadly disease. So in this project, we work with color, we establish a horizontal plane as a sort of ID of, an, of a normality. And then the whole project is about establishing a space on that plane. Next project, um, based on the story of so-called Juana Maria, uh, a Native American from the San Nicolas tribe. Um, her, they were living on San Nicolas Island, and um, yeah, missionaries uh, came to the island and uh, removed her tribe as a sort of idea of rescue. They forgot her, or she hid, one, no, one doesn't know. Um, anyway, she stayed on for 18 years on the island, all by herself, before she too was taken away by missionaries and brought to the mainland where she died after a few weeks. Um, one cubit is 45.7 centimeters. We designed the building or a structure that consisted of several gardens and several spaces, uh, having an idea that the structure would comfort her. She must have had dreams of inclusion and persistence. Uh, the last character is Lendert Hassenbosch, um, a Dutch sailor in the 18th century. Um, on the, in the middle of the Atlantic, well, he was sort of discovered being a homosexual, and he was set ashore on Ascension Island, an, an inhabited island, where he lived for five months, six months maybe, before he died of starvation. He kept a diary, which was found um, several years later by British sailors. We believe he must have dreamt of acceptance and had a yearning to surrender. Yeah, his 
measurement is one EL, 68 by 6 centimeters, yeah, centimeters. We think it's very interesting that throughout all this time and all these places, the one basic measurements, are, they are very similar. So here's the structure, here's the space. Interior space covered by a very, very large translucent membrane, which you can enter uh, in the end. So to something else altogether, a house, a summer house in Sweden, also outside Norway. A beautiful natural site, lots of visible bedrock, lots of large boulders brought to the site by the, uh, by the glacier. Uh, to build anything on this site would normally mean to change the site quite a lot with um, construction roads, blasting enough space for foundations or filling up to establish flat areas. Uh, we, we thought it would, or it was very important to keep the qualities of the site. Uh, so we decided to, to, to establish a building that spanned between the flat bedrock surfaces. Then the building would not touch the ground very much, it wouldn't change the site, and also it would connect sort of um, surfaces that were very useful, but sort of uh, not so easily accessible. So, so we decided to, to build a bridge, uh, a glue lamp bridge. Um, it was clear that it had to be a timber structure uh, because it's light. Uh, and it can be transported uh, to the site easily. Um, the arches span 29.7 meters, it's a long span, and the whole building is, is suspended in the arches. A lot of work went into um, finding the right relation between theory and terrain. <laughs> uh, uh, the only sort of uh, contact points are these drilled holes into the bedrock. Uh, and then we designed some special uh, stainless steel brackets that could, um, could fit into these holes and could receive the glue lamb arches. Uh, these are just photos of testing the geometry for the brackets. The brackets being welded on site. Uh, the arches installed, and as you see, the rest of the timber uh, structure is uh, is hanging in these arches uh, above the the boulders. The um, the floor is, uh, or the the bottom of the structure is not horizontal. It has this keel, uh, both because of the span across between the, the walls, but also to give enough height to, to lead water and sewer and, and these kinds of things uh, throughout the length of the house. The house is um, on grid and also has bergvarme, um, whatever that is in English. <laughs> uh, it's a long house, narrow house. Um, uh, a sort of a central room, or not central room, but the main room is 25 meters long. Uh, bedrooms with lots of sliding doors, so one can get different sort of spatial cons constellations depending on what sort of privacy you want to have, what sort of light conditions are you want to have. Because of the uh, the somewhat extreme structure, uh, stability is important. All the, uh, the roof structure and the floor structure is diagonal to make it stable. It's, uh, the, the structure is also connected to the ground uh, with a bridge in the back, which is also drilled into the, into the rock. 
as you can see from this section. There was a requirement in the regulation that the house needed to have a gabled roof of 30 degrees and it needed to be grey. That was the only regulation. So here is the house as it is. Uh, it's really not, um, the site is not very much changed. Uh, the bedrock is the, is the outdoor floor. The interiors um, are quite simple, uh, clad in plywood. Here you see through all the bedrooms. Um, here you see from the bedroom out into the main room, to the work desks. Uh, we think it's uh, an important quality in the house is the presence of the arches that run through the building in all its length. Um, in many of our projects we work with, with circles <laughs> and straight lines and we think it's something very soothing with this curve running through the space. Um, yeah, this is from the other side. Uh, the maximum height underneath the house is three meters uh, in the western end and about 120 in the eastern end. I'm going really fast, so I think there will be time for maybe all the projects. This is uh, a project we, we ended uh, that was opened um, this summer, last summer. Uh, it's a memorial at um, Utøya Kaya. Some of you might remember, uh, I don't expect all of you to remember, there was a, a terrible terror attack in Oslo uh, in 2011. A Norwegian right-wing lone wolf blew up the government quarters and um, made enormous damage in the center of Oslo. Um, Eight people were killed in Oslo, and in that sort of turmoil of the of the incident, he he took his car and drove um, up here, where he parked his car and took the small ferry that you see here over to this island, Utøya, where the Labour Party had their summer camp for youth. Um, he was dressed as a policeman and went around and executed 69 kids. Um, we were, we were. Um, there's a sort of pre-story to this to this project, and that was there was an art competition won by Jonas Dahlberg, a uh, Swedish uh, artist. Uh, a very nice project, uh, sort of cut in the in the landscape on a small sort of uh, small tongue of land leading out into the fjord. Uh, a bit north of Utøya. Um, it was controversial, uh, both among the, the survivors and especially among the locals. And the locals didn't want it. They wanted to sue the state uh, and the project was stopped. Uh, uh, because one did not want to have a, law, a court case where survivors and... and uh, families were sort of um, um, arguing against each other f uh, for this memorial. So the project was stopped and, uh, and uh, a new project was proposed or a new site was proposed. Um, here, this is the ferry stop or the sort of land side of Utøya. You see the ferry here. Uh, it was a proposed that one built a memorial on this site here uh, because this site was instrumental in the attack. Uh, this was from where the terrorists left. This was where many of the kids swam to across the bay in order to save their lives. And it was also where the rescue operation started, the largest rescue operation since the, uh, the war. 
uh, when we got the commission, uh, the site had been changed. The reconstruction of Utøya itself had sort of required uh, a large, sort of quite rough road leading down to the uh, to the parking area, which was also enlarged. Uh, we thought the uh, this new road, which was really just, it was a lot of landfill and a rough ro road on top of it. We thought it was unfortunate. It was quite beautiful or quite, it made a lot of sense. The old road where you came down here and you sort of had the whole uh, dock area in front of you. Uh, with a road like this, you would sort of stumble onto the site. Uh, to the memorial, and then you had to sort of turn and go back and park your car here. So we suggested a new road, also as a, it was a requirement from the municipal or from the road municipality that buses had to be taken down to the parking area. That was not possible with with this road. Uh, so we uh, we designed a new road, uh, sort of. Uh, leading you using all the length of the of the site to get the right angle for the buses. It led you down to the dock area in the very other end than the memorial, which was up here. You could let go of the cars, you could let go of all the sort of pragmatics here, and and this area over here would be quiet. Um, in addition to to being a memorial and a road, we also had to design a new dock for the for the ferry uh, dock areas for Utøya, sort of waiting uh, roof from where the kids could or where the kids could wait for the ferry. Uh, lots of technical rooms under the road. It was a large project. I will not talk so much about that. I'll talk about the memorial itself. It was a very um, difficult uh, task. Uh, we met every month with two different reference, group, reference groups. One group consisting of the survivors and their families and the Labour Party and Utøya. Uh, and another group consisting of a sort of commission that was established by the state, looking after the sort of national intentions. Uh, it became very clear that uh, these two groups have had different expectations for the memorial. Uh, and uh, we spent a lot of time uh, figuring out how to actually commemorate such a terrible incident. Uh, we decided to, uh, to try to get in touch with uh, with uh, phenomena that are larger than ourselves. We looked at the movement of the sun. Um, the site is here. It's actually a quite beautiful site. Um, very sheltered, looking out westwards towards the island and the fjord. And every day the sun passes over here. And every day the sun stands at the exact same position as it did when the government quarters blew up when the terrorist shot his first victim and when he was arrested. And then we used these directions to create the geometry. Uh, we, we had two sort of ideas for the memorial. One was that the shape should be specific and it should be connected to the incident. Um, and it should not uh, exist before. It should be a shape that would not have existed if it was not for this incident. Also, it should be possible for the shape to sort of receive 77 uh, elements, um, one physical manifestation of each victim. Uh, we also wanted to get in contact with the water. Uh, somehow the water has a very um, soothing effect. <laughs> And it's also the only thing that is a direct connection to the island. You cannot get to this island unless you're invited. Uh, then we, we also had a, had a sort of constraint or, or idea 
that um, uh, we shouldn't, we didn't want to make a, a brutal place. We didn't want to tell people how they were to react here. We wanted to pay, make a place where it actually could be good to be, so that you could grieve in your own way or commemorate these people in your own way. So using the directions uh, and wanting sort of a long shape, we made this um, stair, which is also a retaining wall. Uh, and uh, it runs along the shore and sort of ends as a dock, as a gesture to the boat people or the sort of local people on the fjord that took part in the rescue operation. A model of the project. On the first step, uh, we placed uh, 77, or we suggested 77 columns in bronze, uh, each of them different, and each of them also connected. Um, different in the way that each of the columns, uh, column is turned towards the sun, so that during the passage of the sun, each column will reflect or get a sort of clear reflection of the sun. So all these twists are different. They are connected at the top so that together they make a very, very strong structure. Uh, Utøya is, uh, or this whole area, is part of an interesting geological area. Uh, that has some stone, some types of stones that only exist in this area. So we used gravel um, from this stone, this red gravel, and uh, a Norwegian anorto sit for the stairs, and uh, and then the bronze structure. It all li lays very very close to the water, as you can see here. You also partly see the dock. Um, everything that is related to the memorial function is in bronze. Everything that is more pragmatic is in stainless steel. This is uh, the roof where, the, where you can wait for the boat. These are from the columns. The columns are placed 60 centimeters apart so that you can walk through them, you can sit between them. Um, every time we're there, there's flowers laying around. What we spent a lot of time on was the names. We didn't want the... It was a requirement that the name and the age of the victim should be present. Um, we didn't want to make a, a name in a regular alphabet. It would be like a name tag. So we designed these 77 reliefs. Uh, working with tilted surfaces, sort of deep reliefs in the bronze, um, um, writing the names in this way. And as the sun passes, the shadows change, and, uh, and the sort of it's, it has some sort of ephemeral <laughs> quality. At the same time, it it's really invites you to, to touch the surface. And bronze, of course, has this quality that when you touch it, it gets uh, shiny after a while. I'm on overtime. Shall I skip the last project? Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you so much, Beata. And it, it really feels strange to say that you shouldn't continue. But we also will have uh, our panel discussion now. And we want to thank you so much, both of you, for these truly fascinating presentations. Um, so let's continue now with our discussion and also invite our audience to pose questions and bring up thoughts of interest. Uh, we will have two people with the microphones here. Exactly. Yes. Microphones yeah. are over yeah. there, over there. Yeah, okay. great. Good. Yeah, and as I said, um, last this year, uh, 
it's an occasion when we take the opportunity to discuss how architecture acts as an important agent in the transition towards a sustainable society. And uh, we've built this symposium upon the keywords aesthetics, sustainability and inclusion. Exactly. And uh, now before lunch, we will discuss the aspects of uh, beauty and sustainability. After lunch, we will focus on inclusion. So the togetherness of the new European Bauhaus framework. We're going to use the words beauty and aesthetics in an intermingled fashion. And this is to enhance their similarities and also to enhance the word beauty, which is seldom used within architecture, uh, to keep within the vocabulary of the new European Bauhaus. It is important to use the word beauty. Yeah, so we're going to uh, start by posing one, two questions to the presenters individually, and then we're open from, for um, uh, questions from the audience. So please come up, uh, Michele and uh, Beate and Per. Yes. Yes. So, uh, if there is time, we also have a few questions we would like the, you to discuss among you. So, we'll see, we'll see <laughs> what time we have. So, uh, I will start with uh, posing the question to Beata and Per. Um, you have a record of projects which are renowned for their sculptural qualities and aesthetic properties and carefully designed detailing. Um, and most architects would see this as the, the ultimate commission. Um, how, how do you manage to carry these aspects all the way through, from the initial sketches uh, to the final built uh, project? It's a, there's so many stages. So how do you keep the core within the project all the way through? Uh, shall I start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Women, I mean, that's uh, that requires a credo, <laughs> not an answer. <laughs> um, I mean, we. Um, I don't know how we manage. I mean, we just do our best, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, but I think that uh, it can be said that we. We spend a lot of time uh, on projects. <laughs> uh, we um, we uh, uh, yeah, we probably will never become rich architects. <laughs> uh, so we spend a lot of time on the um, on the development, and we are very concerned that we uh, sort of that we get a good relationship with the, uh, with. The client, um, so that we actually can talk freely about things, also about not only the sort of practical issues, but everything that is immeasurable, <laughs> all those qualities that are so important. And uh, so we, we, we try to establish that, and we also we emphasize that it's important that we follow up on the site and follow up the process okay. all the way through. So it's not a sort of we don't design in one to hundred and leave it to the contractor. It's always, uh, yeah, we follow it up. Mm. Every screw is drawn. <laughs> mm. I, I can also say that um, I think every project is is very it's special and then they are so different. Mm. Uh, every time, so we also we don't have one way of doing things or one solution for for every time. So we try to find out. Um, what is special and what to spot what is uh, important in every in every project that's not so no original but but we really uh, try to do that and and um, find out how to work out uh, mm. yes yes and I was actually also thinking that um, uh, I think that these paper projects that we do are actually important for our build work. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I've heard people saying that, and I also can see it m myself, that, that topics that we bring into the discussion in paper projects, they resurface in, in other commissions. Mm -hmm. But you say this, that you, you bring up, you try to keep what is important, but what is important to you uh, m might 
not be clear to to th the various parts within the design process. So, is it something in the dialogue? Is it something that you grasp early on, that you continue putting forward, or mm. are you thinking uh, about what if they're establishing a framework with their yeah. client, maybe? Mm. I, th I just think it's very important to have tr trust, uh, sort of mutual trust, and, and as I said, tr be able to talk to each other. I mean, communication is crucial. <laughs> One needs to be able to put words to ideas. How can you know what you think before you can hear what you say? It's a famous quote, but it's, uh, it's uh, true. <laughs> One has to be able to talk together about solutions. Mm. And we have also have a lot of doubt. You showed this section, project, all, all these sections. It's, mm. it's uh, we feel very much the same or at home in this mm. way of working. A lot of doubt all mm. the time, developing, trying out, talking a lot mm. together. Mm. Fine. I thought that was, I think it was very interesting to see. Mm. Mm. see in it's our, like in our is. case, the, the section was the easier point where uh, all the contributors, mm. many people mm. could, take, could uh, mm. take consistency because mm. uh, was what was difficult during the process to keep the process on the right way was the necessity of uh, involving more colleagues because, uh, of course, mm -hmm. the, the main team was very small, three PhD students plus me, but then uh, different expertise were needed. Mm -hmm. And so the, the section was chosen as the point where everybody could contribute in a quite easy and controlled way mm -hmm. and so be managing the different changes during mm -hmm. the... Mm -hmm the overall the process. We also work in, in huge models mm. uh, in the same way to, to be able to understand and communicate mm. with all involved. Mm -hmm. It's traditional and a very good way of working. Mm. <laughs> uh, ex understanding space. And yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think we should say that at the moment at Spark in Malmö, we can actually see your models from the, uh, the summer house for example, the one we saw, mm. uh, and uh, also models from, from, from another project. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a recommendation yes. for you to go there. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to raise your hands to either of the speakers. Yes, should we take a question? Yeah. Thank you very much for two very interesting lectures. Um, my question is mainly to Per and Beata. Um, it seems to me that in your architecture there is somehow always this presence of the human trace or maybe a human story, often in the material. Um, I think mainly of uh, building from solitude and uh, the rest area where the benches somehow take a very human presence in leaning on each other. Um, why do you believe that it is so important to tell these stories of humanity through architecture? That's a good question. <laughs> Pierre? I you leave it to you <laughs> again. <laughs> uh, um, I, I, I almost don't know what to answer. I mean, we are humans, aren't we? <laughs> we, the whatever we build, it's for, for people. Uh, whether it's uh, public space or memorials or houses or. Uh, I think it's, you know, I can say one thing, and and that is about our our process. We start sketching very r rough uh, sketches and. When we come to a point where we recognize something in the sketches, that is when we know that we have uh, hit the right idea. And this recognition is very much about recognizing some, some hum, hum, human qualities or, I mean, it sounds so pretentious when you say it, but, but it is about... Um, um, uh, Recognizing some some f emotions or so, or something that you feel is is valuable not only to yourself but to others. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Should we continue maybe with a question for Michaela? Yes, let's do that. So um, 
you've already talked a little bit in your presentation about this, but it would be very nice with a bit of uh, uh, maybe emphasis and more, just more explanations. So in this project, the Oxygen Factory, you were representatives of a university in the design process, in the concept stage of the project, as well as through, but this question is specifically about the concept phase. What, which differences did you find uh, if working with a commission and you're from an architectural firm rather than being a representative from an office? Very different setups. Would you like to speak a little bit about that? No, what, what is important to say is that uh, uh, our counterparts, a university in China, is uh, the main actor that usually do design and concept. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's very strange because uh, professional architects are, has a very limited space in China. So there is a lot to do. So then you can see <coughs> many projects by Chinese architects in magazine. Uh, they, are, they are very good. But most uh, of the uh, projects uh, and all big projects like Olympics are done by university or uh, big uh, public firms. Mm -hmm. This is the tradition of the uh, socialist era where... Uh, so uh, imagine that the first... Uh, private professional practice was opened by Yungo Chang, the, that was also the head of department at MIT in 98, 97, so 25 years ago. Before that, no practitioners. So having this experience in China is a very big difference comparing if we should compare with the, the difference between practitioners and university here in Europe. So with this uh, introduction, I will say that uh, our uh, potential contribution uh, by the Chinese partner was exactly focused uh, in what they expected uh, from a uh, European or even, it, let's say, Italian university. They are still uh, the mythology of uh, Italian creativity, Italian design that is, uh, is good for us, even if uh, maybe it's more because of uh, some uh, master in the past as not uh, the present situation. But uh, Italian design and Italian architecture are very well considered. Uh, while uh, in the big design institute where 1,000 architects work uh, with a very fast rhythm, they have no time and no the possibility to develop uh, concepts. So this is why they mo mainly involved in this case and also in new cases in the next in the present years, uh, exactly on this in providing concept uh, with a quite di dialogic way because being two universities concepts also are parts of the research discussion. Uh, also PhD students develop uh, some topic from the projects. For instance, this uh, project uh, was the starting point of a um, doctoral research uh, on the topic, starting from the idea of the playground uh, I mentioned before that was called urban ergonomics. So how to create and design a new, new strategy to design public space uh, more uh, easy and more uh, efficient to be used uh, as public space for leisure, uh, sport, uh, relax, uh, with a more direct touch with the human body. Because uh, typically in cities, we have no uh, a deep relation with the surfaces of the city. Is it impossible in, the, in town, go, like in the beach, uh, stay down and take the sun. Maybe here in, uh, in the northern countries is, is better. There are many places like this. But in China and in South Euro Europe, typical public space doesn't welcome very much the human body in its scale, its behavior, its movements. And so from this background, uh, two students, PhD students, one from Polito and one from Tsinghua, started this research. So it's a, from the concept also scientific research, uh, often, not always, often, uh, continues. Mm. So does this continue as well, the, the collaboration now with... Uh, with yes, yes. We, with Tsinghua University, yeah. they are our main partners, uh, mm. so we have a lot of um, mm. PhD students in common. Mm. And you are setting up something alike in South America now, are you? No, this is another uh, new step uh, that is involving uh, practitioners, not only PhD candidates that were uh, most of the energy and the workforce for this this Olympic project was done totally internally to Polito. While for new projects, we have this uh, team of uh, 12 uh, professionals. All of them are uh, former students of Polito. So that, and uh, we work in this combined way with research that is better because now we do 
more our our work. We do the uh, research on site. Uh, we, we give a first concept. We, but we don't. While in Shugang was a little bit strange because we we had as researcher to go till a schematic design with structural issues that is not. I don't think is the is right is good. Is right at university because then there is also some conflict between what researcher and practitioner can do because uh, we. Uh, while uh, now with this team of practitioners, we do the uh, research part, uh, the um, interpretation of the site, uh, the, the, we contribute with the concept with the practitioner, then they continue under our guidelines to do the more practical issues. And now, after two years working with the 12, uh, let's say, Chinese uh, architects from Torino, we open a new team uh, with 12 uh, working in Latin America, particularly in Colombia, because of some <laughs> partnership in Colombia mm -hmm. with, with them. It's a new formula. We want to work yeah. a lot on this because we believe, and also this will be the topic of an event uh, we are doing, can I advertise? The, the, the <laughs> we jointly are preparing uh, in the Form Design Center in, uh, in July 3rd, exactly, uh, comparing and sharing experiences uh, of the interaction between university and, and practitioners in design issues. Mm. Uh, so there were, will be from European cases where uh, this is happening uh, and which is the, the critical result of this yeah. relation. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a good opportunity to, to lift this to, to this audience yeah. so we <laughs> keep our eyes open. When was it? The, in July? The, the third. No? The third. Uh, the, during the OAA, in the same days of the... Um, World Congress uh, in Malmo yeah. in the Form Design Center, we will have this event mm -hmm. yeah. open to all the students and architects. Yeah. Should we see if we have any uh, questions in the audience to Michele? Yes. Y yes. Would, and a mic for mm -hmm. Sandy. Thank you. You can do it in Italian if you want. <laughs> <laughs> perfect Italian. <laughs> <laughs> So I, actually, I want to ask you about one moment in your presentation that I, I identify with, and I would like it to be a little bit to discuss it in a, in a platform of a university when sometimes we have to negotiate aesthetics because we open up for messiness. And you know, there is open a moment for, 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 for uh, Mess processes okay. where you would say, you know, maybe the final result did mm. not come what it should be mm -hmm. because we have this, 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 and that. And this is something that working in a place like Palestine, we have been always obliged to sort of think participate. When you open participation up, you have to negotiate your aesthetics. You know, it's, there is no escape. I don't think that there is escape in that sense. So either you would choose to be an artist in that sense, you know, being at the intersection of art and architecture. So either you have your studio, you are in, you produce your things, you control them, you sort of negotiate that with your client. They come to you because of your aesthetics. The other way around, which I find a bit less present in universities today, because, you know, this being in studio is only a, a small percentage of what architecture is today. I mean, we are barely uh, interacting with maybe 1% of the architecture in, in the world. And the, the 99% is still super available, but I think that our inability of negotiating our own aesthetics are something that we have to deal with, and this is what we teach our students. We teach all of them to be star architects and not to negotiate their aesthetics, right? So I think this is something that I would love in some way to understand how can we talk about it in universities, because we, we, we face it constantly. And maybe also reminding a little bit about, you know, this, this is a, a bit coming back to Italy and, and the dangers of speaking about beauty, because we still have a lot of untouched fascist architecture, speeches of Mussolini are still in Italy present because they are beautiful, right? So also, I would like to, to problematize that kind of beauty and aesthetics, because if we don't share beauty and aesthetics, we impose them. And you know what it takes to our egos as architects to think that negotiating that aesthetics would be a possibility, but then we have to create a whole new vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So if you have 
I don't know, we grades students, right? So if you have 30 out of 30 for your aesthetics, because you stayed in your studio, you might get out of 30 of participation five, right? And if you can get 30 out of participation and then 10 in your aesthetics, you would be a better architect. So I mean, can we a little bit also make ruptures in our universities? And my interest is that how it is in Torino, especially in a place like Italy. I mean, I studied in Italy, I work there, where aesthetics is put on the top of the thing. So I'm asking what, how, what are your challenges? Because in some way, in part of your, uh, you wanted to escape aesthetics, but I know how painful this might be in a place like Italy and maybe in Europe in general. So. I would, because it has been one of the pains I am through, so I would like to ask you uh, how, how you feel about it. I divide my answer in two parts. One more specific uh, about what happened in this uh, situation. I add something is uh, the, um, there was a chief architect, Professor Zhang Li, that nowadays is the dean of the School of Architecture in Qingba, that we had a very direct relation because he invited me to teach. So he said, uh, he said to me, uh, Please do the project, you can organize whatever you prefer, more individually, in a team, and we can have a direct uh, touch during the whole process. And so this was a decision, so having me and a couple of uh, collaborators uh, drawing uh, according to our vision, or trying to socialize this project with the academic community that uh, in a, say, public structure like a university where uh, one uh, important goal is to involve uh, our colleagues in these uh, international operations because it's not easy. So people prefer to stay in the typical situation, being local, being in, a, in the, what they do every day. They, when you have to push people to come to China to do uh, quite uh, hard operation in international affairs, uh, you have to involve. You have, and so at the end, uh, the decision was to, to create a team uh, try to involve as much as professor possible in the department. And so the, at, at that moment, uh, I was very conscious of what you said, that the uh, ambition to have an aesthetical view, a direction of the project was uh, lost some way because of negotiation with around 40 people. But this, and the second part is, uh, is important, is that at least uh, observing, uh, the, let's say, the global uh, profession in the, in the, in the world uh, and uh, thinking as a teacher, I think that uh, I see that most of the process nowadays uh, are uh, based uh, on uh, negotiation of the decision. So uh, design institutes in China where they are 1000 and maybe there is a chief architect, but then uh, the, the final result come out uh, fro from uh, many decisions, many choices. So this kind of structure all around the world are doing probably 95% of, uh, of uh, the building, of the architecture. So I don't know if uh, we have to teach our students to be ready only to this 5% of very good and very interesting part of architecture that you represented very well. So your small projects, very high quality, are uh, where uh, still uh, the talent and the the individual contribution is very important, but I, I'm sure that 90% uh, of our students will work uh, around the world in very different conditions. Maybe where you are one among 50 and you have, you have to be, I don't mean that you have to abandon any ambition of aesthetics or result, but you have to be very well trained to share this and to negotiate this with a big group. Because this, I see this will be the future of most architectural production in, uh, in the coming years or still already now. So uh, this is why in uh, studios as a teacher, we, we simulate this kind of uh, dynamics. We don't leave the student alone to do, please do your best and stop. We try to make this kind of negotiation and simulation of how to discuss about uh, final result. Mm. I'm very glad that you bring that up, Sandy. And I'm just thinking here that what this is all about is how it's intertwined the concept of aesthetics, sustainability and inclusion and how it is intertwined. So that is, and also the skills of negotiating these values. So, I mean, that is what we are 
discussing here and how we teach our students to do so. Um, maybe it's not one or the other, it's how they depend mm. upon each other and in what context one has to, to lift either of them when it's sort of uh, lost in, in, in a process and wh who is taking care of that. And I would say that we as architects will have to take care of all these three aspects. So, uh, do we have... I think it is time to it start is time rounding to off, round off. Actually. It is. But we will come back here. Um, see that we say the right hour now? One? One o'clock sharp. One o'clock sharp. Yeah. Mm. For, for our, our afternoon where we focus more on the... Togetherness. Uh, togetherness yes. aspect. So thank you so much and we meet up a little bit later.
Okay, welcome back uh, to the 2023 edition of the Lund Architecture Symposium. Uh, I hope you all had a good lunch and have had some time to get some coffee. Um, just a recap, during the morning uh, we have listened to Michele Bonino and to the Norwegian office Mantecula with Per and, uh, and Beate. Uh, they were talking a lot about dealing with aesthetics and sustainability, materiality, identity, and these aspects of, of architecture. Uh, this afternoon we will cover some slightly different uh, aspects of the year's topic. Uh, we will continue to draw on the new European Bauhaus's concepts, uh, but we will deal more with inclusion, social inclusion, uh, democratic aspects of architecture. And the afternoon will be guided by uh, our, our colleague uh, and artist, uh, Sandy Hilal. It's great to have you here, Sandy. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Sandy is a Lisa Meitner professor at the department since a couple of years back and uh, been very active here. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what, what will happen in the afternoon? Yes, actually, uh, in the afternoon, I think we will have a little bit of a more an uh, experience. So it will be two uh, lectures that uh, Zoe and uh, Morten will uh, give us. And then we will move together for the questions and uh, actually potential discussion on in a living room situation inside uh, the university. And I think this whole attempt to understand that knowledge don't happen e only inside classrooms, but you know the fact that we sort of, when we sit with our grandparents, when we discuss with our parents, when we discuss with our neighbors, when we negotiate uh, with our father and mother, this is all actually dealing with us being architects. It's a way of being architects. So in some way, I would like to expand the learning experience somewhere else, even if it is only a few meters away. The fact to understand how space can be powerful in changing our way of being, talking, sitting, being together and even discussing. So after we finish here, we will uh, be moving to the living room. Uh, that was very nicely set by Helen. So, I mean, I'm so grateful. I only say I would like to have my living room in the university and suddenly it's there and it's beautiful if we want to it's speak fantastic. about beauty. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and there during the afternoon, because there's been some talk about this artwork that will be kickstarted today and then continue tomorrow and on Friday where our students be, will be invited to participate. And you will all get more information about that uh, during the living room conversation that yes. starts after the, uh, the uh, lectures with a cup of tea also. I think Helena's organized tea and cookies for us over there. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. a real living yeah. room experience. But Thank you. I'll give the word to Sandy and I'll sit down and shut up and, uh, <laughs> and you. Yeah, I mean, work. what I have only to do now is to introduce uh, Morten and uh, Zoe. And indeed, you know, I, I normally don't like introductions. It's not one of my favorite things because sometimes it might feel super institutional. So I decided I will tell you why I'm so happy that Zoe and Morten are here today and, and how I met them, because this is a bit of a nicer way of explaining what they are for me rather than what they are within an institutional uh, set. And indeed, I will begin maybe with uh, Morten. And, and the first time I met you, maybe we never talked about this, but it was a moment where I visited Trampoline House. And there was a bit of a, that class around democracy, through democracy, et cetera, et cetera. And I have to admit that I was quite skeptical, you know, being a migrant in Europe, coming in a place where I thought it's the usual European teaching democracy to others. And yet I was faced with one of the nicest place ever. I mean, it was an amazing discussion with everybody was fighting with everybody, talking with everybody and and somehow, uh, you know, it, it was this house that created that uh, atmosphere. And, and, you know, I want to quote you on two things that, you know, I'm interpreting maybe what you told me or, or what you were speaking about, is that, you know, you was convinced that in order to save the Danish democracy, 
you have to create these pieces where, where refugees will help you saving what you think is the essence of democracy. And therefore, you wanted this house to create that possibility of interaction and to facilitate that interaction. And maybe the second thing that you told uh, us when we were in Antwerp, I mean, because I met him uh, several times, was a bit when the house was not anymore the house, the trampoline house as the house was taken away. And in some way you were realizing the power of that house on your practice and in which way having a house that would permit you to be flexible. If you would need something, you will build it. If you will need another thing, you will interact on it. And the moment that you lost it and you find yourself maybe in a more stiff and very organized architecturally space, you realize that you know this flexible house that you used to have was not anymore there. And maybe this is the way that as an architect, I would love to think architecture, you know, how architecture is able, no matter, you know, how a house is able to provide place to discuss seriously democracy when, when it is hard to discuss democracy in the plaza. When a house is able actually to provide that such fluid dynamics, when that dynamics outside of that house is so stiff, is what I am really interested in. And you know, a few of you might think, why in a faculty of architecture? I, I do believe that today, more than ever, we really need to understand how these houses and how examples like the one of Trampoline House can play a crucial role in thinking architecture in a political, sustainable, social way. And, and for us as architects to actually give ourselves the role and the task to actually think about architecture as a with its possibility to create real impact and not only as us of being able to provide nice design pieces in the city that many people are happy to go and visit and see, yet I think this is only part and it is a very nice part and we need to continue developing this. But I think we also need to understand how a place like Trampoline House and maybe other would become a crucial part of our thinking architecture today. So I think this is a bit the second uh, part. And I would come then to uh, Zoe. So, I mean, Zoe is a, a great friend. She's also, I would say, a recent uh, great friend. It's only, it was during the lockdown that um, we met and we met in a moment where we were realizing that the world is becoming bigger and bigger, that you know, we were locked down inside our houses, but we also had that possibility of connecting to the whomever we would like to connect with. And there was a moment with, where me and, and my partner in work and, and um, life, Alessandro Petti, and with Walter Mignolo, we decided to, in a moment of lockdown and depression, we decided to create what we call tense of thoughts. So it's we, we, we wanted to have that tent where we can think together with others. And, and I still remember, you know, uh, Walter suggested Zoe for the meeting. And we were actually bringing people thinking that this is the way we will create new friendship, extended our friendships. And the moment I actually met with Zoe, at least during the meetings, each time she will speak, she will bring me back to foundation. Now we speak about foundations in, in, in architecture. And sometimes it's, I really like it each time she wanted to speak because I think, okay, we are somewhere back to where we should go. So in some way I, I have uh, you know, no pressure, Zoe. <laughs> and in another maybe experience I had with Zoe that has been a bit of a way of me to understanding also writing in architecture because we tend, I, I am not, I don't like writing that much. It's not something that I really, um, I'm, I'm, I consider myself good at, yet I found myself writing books and other things and articles. But there was a moment where I was so sad about the closure of a living room project in the north, and I was talking with Zoe about it. And I was dreaming that I will one day have a house that I will own, turn it into a summer house for refugees, where I would really get in the heart of what Scandinavian countries is about and be able to create that kind of, uh, you know, it's a bit of a profanation desire. I wanted to profane that idea of the summer house 
houses. And I was talking with Zoe around it and, and expressing from one side anger of this, ha this project being taken away and on the other side how I would like to open up society, how there is a myth around certain houses and certain places in certain cultures that are inaccessible. And suddenly, I mean, Zoe is a great curator, but she is an amazing also writer. And suddenly, I mean, she wrote all what I was telling her in a way that I was just like, really? Um, and, and from being it unrealized project that I feel that I will never be able to have the means to realize it or do it, by her writing that piece, I felt already in peace in some way. I mean, I felt that part of the project has been already realized. And, you know, it, it has been not only bringing my words into a written material, but almost actually helping me sometimes to achieve certain things that we might not achieve in reality, but the moment we spill them down out, no matter if it's with words, if it's with architecture, or if it's with other things, then we suddenly see them there. So this is why I think, you know, it's extremely important to understand architecture as different mediums, you know, in, in that sense, by writing through Zoe, by understanding how to transform a house into the most public democratic space in a place like Copenhagen today, by these are for me essentials in architecture. And, and this is why I'm extremely happy to be today with both of you and cannot wait to hear your lectures. And Zoe, please come in. Thank you, Sandy, for inviting me. And to Lund University for bringing me to Sweden, to Scandinavia for the first time. And I have to admit, moving from 35 degrees to zero and jet lag, excuse me if I falter momentarily. <laughs> but I, I do appreciate the introduction. And you're probably all a little bit like, she's Chiang Mai, Thailand, doesn't sound Thai. I'm Australian. I'm Hong Kong British, born in Australia, spent the last 15 years in Vietnam, and the last year relocated to Thailand. As Sandy mentioned, I am a curator, but not one that typically works inside what we would understand an exhibition to be. I come from a museum background. My experiences of the art world started in dense forms of infrastructure where we had working museums, universities, libraries, critics. And now, for the last 20 years, I've been working in places where that does not exist. Or it is incredibly ideologically controlled. So what I'm sharing with you today is sustaining memory, building agency through art and its social architecture, but particularly focusing on communities suffering political poverty and thinking about what kind of access do we assume communities to have to their cultural forms of infrastructure. And I want to particularly focus on that assumption. So, how do we give agency to the negotiation of our tangible, visible realities? And what social architectures are compromised and with what impact? An artist by the name of Win Chun Thi recently prompted me to ask in the production of a new work, what is your earliest memory? Is it sound or an image? And it was a curious question, one that immediately made me realize that I was recalling photographs, not actually an intangible memory. But when it came to recalling the sound I recall most, it was an odd one. It was the sound of a glass sliding door, a heavy one, slow and measured. And it was the door to my local regional art gallery in a small town in Newcastle, Australia. My mother, she used to regularly take me as a child, and I remember its design being quite bulky, heavy, much like most government buildings in the city. 
And I remember walking the gallery walls full of oil paintings by Australian white masters, telling the story of Australia, its history, and its people. As an Australian with a Chinese father, British mother, I grew older realizing that these walls rarely changed its story and that my own family's history had no picture here. Where did I belong on these walls and in these institutions? Was I not Australian? I remain fascinated by the fact that the way I have chosen to remember this childhood memory is through sound, and it's a heavy glass door. And it, every time I hear a glass door, I am transported back to that particular space. And this has prompted my adult self to remind that memories are not only aesthetic, they are deeply full of aesthesis, a threshold of perception that is sensorial. I have another door to share. Though this one is an anecdote of research relayed from my colleagues at the Queensland Art Gallery in Brisbane, where I once worked in Australia, in the development of what's called the Asia-Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art. I'm referring particularly to the one that occurred in 1999. This is Sonabai. She's an artist who participated in that show. She's from the Rajwa community of Chattisgarh in India. And she was invited to participate with her clay figurines that you can see on the walls of her home, which she actually recreated for the gallery walls of the exhibition, which shared various local folk stories, which is how her community shares its cosmological history. My colleagues shared that she had actually never traveled outside her village and that her arrival in Brisbane, Australia for this particular show posed a cultural challenge for she had never slept in a structure with doors. Her understanding of privacy particularly was other to what we understand in the West. Toilets were a particular problem. But what was even more unexpected was the offense taken by other participating Indian artists who saw her art and her obvious struggle to negotiate Western social ways of life as an abomination. She, Sonabai, is a Dalit, which is the lowest caste in the Hindu system. The other Indian artists participating were Brahmin, the top caste. Sonabai's traditions, her craft, were considered an embarrassment to the Brahmin, not considered worthy of representing an India in their eyes. I'm sharing memory recall here to canvas the dilemmas of how do we sustain cultural memory in our globalizing worlds where the lived negotiation of inclusion in the visible needs to be better ethically heard, particularly in our value systems, which are too often relying on a cited reference of theoretical assertion. For I'm drawn particularly to the affective nature of experiential recall, of how such affect intermingles between relations of sociality and the cultural or political regulations of fear and discrimination, often surrounding entrance and negotiation of the built environment. Here are a few more recent experiences to share with you that are relevant to this discussion of what I want to more pose is as thesis and memory. And they all take place in Vietnam, a country that was 15 years of my life. It is the morning of the opening of Phuong Quang's exhibition in Saigon at San Art, an institution I was the director at the time. And the show is fully installed. The bamboo cage is his signature motif, appearing not only in the suite of photographs where classrooms and car show rooms are staged under a bamboo prison, but also architecturally, with the entire building of San Art encased in a bamboo cage. Typically, we have just received word from the Vietnamese Ministry of Culture that we are only allowed to show one photograph of the 11 submitted. San Art, however, decides to take a risk. We remove the censored photos, placing signs in their stead stating, not allowed for exhibition. 
we open to a curious public accustomed to political interference, who think nothing of the fact that the image of being caged is prohibited, but the experience of entering one is not. The next day, artist and staff are interrogated by cultural police. San Art is fined and its business license nearly revoked because we made public the official censoring license of the show, which isn't normally done. A group of artists and interdisciplinary thinkers have gathered for a private group critique for an emerging artist at San Art Laboratory, our residency program, which occupies a domestic four-story terrace building in a small residential alley in Saigon. Artist Wen Gem Dolan turns up late. She has been under house arrest and wasn't sure she would be able to attend. The cultural police are suspicious of her involvement in the dissemination of fish masks designed by local artists in the central city of Hue in protest of the recent environmental catastrophe at the negligent hands of Taiwanese Chinese steel industries, whose toxic runoff had caused tens of dead sea life across Vietnam's vast coastline. Such group, fatigue is, group critique is always invitation only in Vietnam. Comparative critique on a public scale, San Art knows draws unwanted official attention. On this day, the cultural police are lured by Tolan, who had been watching when she left her house, and they wait for her downstairs at San Art. She leaves. One officer remains. He approaches me and says, I need the list of foreigners that attended your private event. Dat Vu is an artist with a candid eye photographically capturing the ritualistic habits of Vietnam, both spiritual and psychological. One image from 60 is integral for him. It shows a typical Vietnamese countryside refuse burning in front of a painted propaganda image on a crumbling black wall, brick wall. The photo has been shot as if the message of the state is what is burning, cunningly framed as rubbish. This image was deliberately left out of the exhibition's official license request. I knew it wouldn't pass. But the artist is pleading with me, please, just the opening night. It's a small image. As the curator director I, of this, it's a very unique purpose-built, first purpose-built structure for contemporary art in the country called The Factory, where I was director at the time, I acquiesced. The morning after the opening, the cultural police turn up. With public security officials, they demand to see the business owner of the factory, not the artist. A new law is in place. The host, the institution, the space, is responsible for content in the artwork, not the artist. I've been invited to attend a student group critique at the painting department of the Ho Chi Minh City Fine Arts University. Paintings of repetitive imagery are set up on easels around the disheveled room. Landscapes and domestic interiors abound in different sticky texture and hue. I ask a student whose annotated photographs are strewn across his space, why don't you include these photographs as an element inside the paintings? His eyes side glance as his teacher, his head's cast down in silence, and the teacher neatly moves on without answer. One of my staff sitting next to me whispers, students are forbidden from working in any medium other than oil or acrylic. Teachers emphasize technique over concept. Any artist daring to be critical or experimental with their imagery will not find faculty support. That was 2019. Such experiences were sadly all too repetitive during my time in Vietnam in my battle to assist artists in sustaining their cultural memory. In this communist country, culture remains governed as a propagandist arm of the state, and thus its artists remain heavily monitored. Their aesthetic closely watched by competing departments, the Ministry of Culture and the Cultural Police. 
in my desire to assist artists sustain their cultural memory, whereby physical locations were adapted or purpose-built as art centers, galleries, studios, I quickly came to realize the burden of publicized space to the integrity of artistic practice. Being visible wrought artistic compromise, anxiety, doubt, ultimately self-censorship. It also meant that audiences were less eager to attend your space, your activities, concerned that their attendance would be officially logged and thus potentially becoming targets of official surveillance. Cultural institutions are regularly watched by the government. So under these circumstances, how do we enable the cultural recall of human contact and its transformation as a pluriversal learning, enabling both guest and host the opportunity to express and thus shape their own experience of access to knowledge and its archive? What are the symptoms we must alleviate to achieve this as cultural workers, as architects, but also as consumers of cultural institutions in zones of political poverty, particularly where the design of violence via censorship and ideology is dangerously normalized? In Vietnam, these questions were a daily address concerning sustainability for me. Where visiting the Ho Chi Minh City Fine Arts University is sadly like walking into a dilapidated and forgotten cemetery. The rituals of its departments remain. The students attend class. The teachers diligently attend their meetings. But the purpose of the rituals are lost. Classrooms actually have no teachers. They go to their meetings, but they don't attend a class. Teachers fail to institute critical curricula. These departments have become mere tombs that have lost their family. Memories lost in an unfortunate tide of indifference, apathy. This university has become a repurposed gravesite for the communist state to demonstrate their disregard, for that's the thorn in their side. It's the culture, the activators, who want to revisit the past in order to move forward. But alas, this country's troubled socialist economy cannot afford such a critical gaze, for there are too many ghosts vying for justice, too much apathy depended upon to feed the country's hoodwinked materialistic gaze. No, this state wants its robots, its people, to flood the market with formula, to march onwards, and thus Vietnam is dangerously becoming the treasure trove of all things successfully mass-produced. And dare I say, most artists repeat the motif of what is sold or at times the most successful. And thus there are so many copycats that the state is now in fear of its people infringing on copyright to the point that students can no longer enter their fine arts museum to sketch what is on view and molding. This described context is relevant in recall of a studio visit with a senior lecturer in the drawing department upon the advice of a colleague who says he has hidden gems. I was ever eager to find local talent. I enter his studio, or rather his office, and he's presenting what is atypical. Tourist shops on the main streets of Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City show the same. Images of traditional architecture with street vendors and conical hats, women in classical alzai lounging seductively under a window. I need give up if not for a set of drawings at the very back of a cupboard that peek out at me that he's really reluctant to share. And I prod and cajole and I say, please, just a look. And with a glance of near shame, he's sharing, oh, but this isn't art, gesturing more proudly towards these national stereotypes. I depart this office, come studio, with a familiar disappointment in realizing that as a curator in Vietnam, I had no ability to sway this man into thinking that he was other than what he thought. But this now requires perhaps a bit of context, for surely you might ask, well, why not? In order to answer this question, let's take a look at what typically motivates an artist. And I'm going to do this by way of a bit of an analogy. In a well-tended cemetery, there are caretakers, and gardeners. There may be a mortuary and a priest. 
and a catalogue which plots that grave that belongs to whom. There may be a plot of land dedicated to a particular family whose ancestors attend to the upkeep of their graves. There may be a plot of land dedicated as memorial to a particular tragic event, which prompts annual remembrance by way of a public gathering each year. These are visible public moments and monuments with symbolic and ritualized collective value and impact. Memorials of destination, the final resting place for the mortal remains of a lifetime of achievement, often with or in memory of those committed to cause. Now, you may think cemeteries are a rather morbid comparison to the systematization of art, its culture. However, in Vietnam, I find it a pertinent yet a sad analogy for just as cemeteries are at times visibly overlooked, unkempt or evicted, similarly, the cultural bodies of Vietnam, its artists, art, galleries, writers, critics, museums, universities and libraries are denied visible cultural respect. Such bodies, alive or dead, possess desire to speak and to act to provoke experimentation, which smacks of a critical individuality that raises the alarm bells of the Vietnamese Ministry of Culture. This ministry's lack of understanding and regard for contemporary art is a product of ideological fear. Suffering a clergy of administrators who care not for the history or livelihood of art and its authors, considering their job more surveillance than innovative development. And perhaps here, the savior to this death malady is the art market. For without it, ironically, I do fear that we would have no visible artists to speak of. For yes, of course, the ministry does understand the neoliberal motivation of money. But I'm, I'm sorry, pardon? You are prioritizing your story behind your art? You don't care about profit. Ah, so there must be something in there that we need to monitor. That's the conversation that goes on in their heads. So to answer that affirmation question of what are the symptoms that we must alleviate in order for culture to be a space of agency, its spaces to become spaces of agency, why is it a challenge for an artist in Vietnam to think and work beyond the visible given? And it is precisely because we have so little tendered infrastructure to beg that an artist reconsider their path. Our museum collections are rotting. Their spaces are largely for hire. Indeed, if you walk into the main floor of the Fine Arts Museum, the first list of information you get is the price list. Our universities are grossly underfunded and without expertise. Our Ministry of Culture in a bureaucratic ignorance and quagmire with our gallerists, predominantly hawking the power of exoticism and tourism, making unregulated millions. And the Vietnamese dong that is measured in millions, that's not hard. So in a society with a fear of individuality that prefers the formula to the deviation, art sadly becomes decoration, thus losing its family, losing its historical lineage and disciplinary memory. Now this may again sound rather glib, but it, this is actually where the point of this sharing gets rather interesting. For if we consider the world of the visible in the sphere of culture, the above ground ritual to continue the mortuary metaphor, particularly the acclaimed site of the exhibition in, in the museum as the historic marker of an artist or a curator's or even an architect's international success, I think it's crucial to ask about what we cannot see of what is underground private, not publicized, and catering for a very particular niche community to beg a consideration of how this hidden landscape motivates and transforms not only artistic labor and its presumed houses of culture, but the processes by which collective transformation of society for the individual can occur. The growth and development of Vietnamese contemporary art has depended upon independent collective activity. Indeed, I would say this is very much the same case across most of the global south. The majority of this without accessible public identity. Thus, to chart exhibition making and its institutionalization as the barometer of collective activity 
is, is, is to deny the labour behind countless gatherings offline and out of sight that have had crucial impact on an artist and curator's ability to commit to their practice. For example, the staging of a solo show for three days in a soon-to-be demolished house. The staging of protest in a remote monastery for the clandestine honouring of books of history. The performance of protest in the wearing of fish masks in defiance of state neglect of local environment. Or the group critiques within friendship networks the open studios for private Facebook communities, or the internal presentations by international guests to select local community of influence. Now, you might be thinking perhaps all such forms sound quite atypical of much artistic production globally. But in Vietnam, such activity is deemed potentially illegal due to official sensitivity towards content under discussion. Thus, it is fear of visibility that sets the scale of ambition. Such a statement is not only directed at artists, but also to the hosts of art, its curators, its architects, its dealers, its museum directors. For in Vietnam, it is the host who is interrogated and held responsible for potential illegitimate action, not the artist, despite their authorship. This surveillance and oppression quite obviously hinders and marginalizes the growth relevance and visibility of contemporary culture to a local community. In my knowing of how Vietnam's affective economy conjures a crisis in sustaining a critical relationship to knowledge, to learning, which I've evidenced in how there's a great lack of institutional inst interdisciplinarity, which is what we typically adv see advocated by museums, universities and libraries, operating in social landscapes where its local cultural memory is buried or hidden. I very much relate to visual theorist Irit Rogoff, who reflects that such absence of such institutions and their disciplinary knowledge can offer an alternative means of learning, but that while such absences allow for a flexibility of operating and for the possibility of invention, be it of archives or subjects or methodologies, there is an ongoing demand for an end product that always coheres around something tangible, physical, like an exhibition, around the fact that we need to concretize and that that all belies the loosening of what we had originally hoped to enter by organizing, by the curatorial operations. She goes on to say that we must rethink the very notion of platform and protocol to further the shift from representation to investigation and to rethink the relations between resource and manifestation. And it is precisely this epistemological crisis that motivates the heart of my own practice as a curator, particularly my love of the dialogical, which is the, the focusing on discussion, the listening, the art of talking, walking, watching, the collective sharing, the collective silences, which is one mode that Sandy and I very much hold in common. And this for me is an excavation of integrity in artistic production and its situated knowledge. If artists, designers and architects are effectively hindered in the making and showing of their work, then I believe people such as myself as curators, the facilitators of culture, the people who are the mediums negotiating the aesthetic architecture of the social, we must nurture the intentions of artists working in a perceived invisibility towards helping them strategize agency. And such agency can range, in my experience, from installing an exhibition that is on display for only a private few, or it's the careful narrativization or collage of metaphor and poetry in an artwork's content so that you can ensure the artist can elude the official senses or it's the classification of objects not as art, but as documentation, thus not requiring official license approval. Such curatorial address explores what Edouard Glissant, a very close philosopher to my heart, refers as relation. It's a process of change in imagination via a generosity in perception. 
This is about how we move. It's an, an errantry that is about not aimlessly wandering a world determined for us, but in knowing that we do know why we are here in this world. And this is a, a conceptual and physical movement that is perhaps motivated by survival, but also a desire to go beyond what we can see, what is being instructed we have access to. And Glissanti says, such duality of self-perception, one is a citizen or a foreigner. This has repercussions on how we approach what is outside of ourselves, what is other. One is a visitor or visited. One goes or stays. One is conquered or is conquering. The thought of the other cannot escape this dualism until the time when we acknowledge the differences. We have to give space to those discussions of differences. So for me, curating, which for me is a kind of design, within such concept, concept where the visible and physical structures of art and culture are fraught with ideological imperatives of commercial self-interest, demands the nurturing of artists as individuals, not products, towards a collective consciousness as opposed to a focus on their tangible artworks. I want to focus on their process, their integrity, their intention, rather than just focusing on their final physical built works. And this demands a detailing of their belonging that recognizes their experience, their knowledge, as an inherent interdependent element of their community and their relationship to the world, to give space to the transformation of how they see the relation between them as a single unit and the collective that they're trying indeed often at times to represent. Gilbert Simondon, he talks about how we have to think about thinking as a networked knowing relative to the times in which we live, for this is not perception but effect. It permits, this is a true appreciation of how the relationship between consciousness and the individual comes about. He says we have to bypass the question of social as a question of form, which is also a question of norms, and consider this a dynamics of energy distribution. And for this, we have to understand that the world is not fixed in its singularities, but it's how we are in disparate relation at once. And this is offering relations in infinitum. For true change to occur, it is less a matter of bodies acting on other bodies than it is a reformulation of matter along the lines of a constellation of information. Simon Don's work has been greatly somewhat dubiously of mass impact on how algorithms rule our lives today. But I'm interested in how he thinks about how the environment of information transforms anxiety. And that I see it as a responsibility that I have to give access to that information in ways that nurtures hope and the, the possibility of an alternate visibility so that that prohibitive landscape doesn't eat and that they don't live in self-censorship. So in light of this highly surveilled landscape in Vietnam, I had to ask myself, what am I going to do? I can't do any visible projects without it being red taped to a degree that I can't represent it. So I conceived this project called Conscious Realities with San Art, and this took a discursive format as its mode. I knew that my funders needed me to do public work. They wanted to see their logos in public environments. I also knew that the cultural police and the Ministry of, of Culture would be needing to know that I had submitted that piece of paper and it was on the desk and they knew what I was doing because if they didn't have that piece of paper, they would be on my door. So this program was very much two-tier. About 30% was visible, but 70% was not. And these private undertakings were particularly important in, in assuaging the doubt and the fear in how we do things, why we do things, where we do things, and engaging the emotive, subjective realm of production, of making, of design, as a critical side of experimentation. So this was realized with a number of different local organizations as hosts. It was composed of guest lectures, workshops, a residency program, group critiques, a publication, there were three public shows and an online video art festival. 
And it all took place so as to unpack Vietnam's presence in the Global South, which is not a discussion had inside its universities. It took place in Saigon and invited key intellectuals from across the Global South of interdisciplinary backgrounds, including architects, from this geography. And we spent time talking, listening, making, reading, recording words and concepts in a critical reassessment of three themes. The role of myth-making, the impact of the social sciences and how we understand and read culture, and the motivations of movement and materiality and how people uh, use their materials as different symbolic geographies. The space of these informal dialogues took place in university performance theatres, galleries that were turned into seminar rooms, residency studios, lounge rooms, downtown bars, amongst others. And it was all about creating casual atmospheres to which this idea of transmitting ideas was not surveilled. One highlight of this program was the participation of writer, editor, cultural commentator, Ntone Ajabe, who comes from Douala, but now lives in Cape Town. And he delivered a public lecture and then a three-day workshop engaging the purpose of his publishing platform called Chimarenga and the motivations behind its various editorial initiatives. For the workshop, which took place on the floor of San Art Street facing residential premise, Ntone emphasized his desire for Chimarenga to offer a differing pictorial and textual cartography of an Africa, differing from what empire's notions of exactitude had created, believing it important, imperative, that the human experiences of emotion, sensation, sensibility, even fear, are treated and considered elements worthy of being mapped. We talked about glissant, his concepts of opacity and transparency, which was overall a very particularly challenging thing for my Vietnamese crew who had never discussed theory in this way, who had never even really unpacked what it meant to be dealing as a post-colonial society. And we tussled between French, English, and Vietnamese as Antone anchored his own words to his experiences, attempting to open up his audience's understanding of what the impact of coloniality was and how there's a, the power of a collective agency in overturning social and cultural assumptions. There were moments during this workshop where tears were shared, frustration burst forth with great confusion on the part of the participants whose desire to grasp these concepts was not easy. And this was an unease that Antone reveled in. He was really determined to emphasize that what the colonized empire wants you to understand is they must look at something and immediately be able to know it, identify it, claim it, classify it, understand it. But Glissant wants us to look at what we don't know and accept it, not classify it. And this was a a whole other kind of conversation for my Vietnamese artist, which was relieved every night by Antone's vinyl decks. He's known as the king of Pan-African beat. So every night we went to the downtown bar and he played to packed fanfare, where we listened to the tunes of decolonizing Africa. And we realized that there are many different ways through which we can learn memory and that it is can be through sound. So to return to this burden of visibility in the seeking to sustain our cultural memory, you might ask why an artist or curator would want to endure such a context. Quite simply, for most, they have little choice. But for me, as a privileged and vital individual with choice, to endure in tandem to collaboratively push and prod and nurture and listen in such conditions is of a unique learning. It is an everyday questioning of method and terms for the survival of culture in such a society. And I'm struck and inspired by just how many communities across the global south contend with a similar degree of this reality. 
such as Cambodia, Senegal, Nigeria, Malaysia, Ecuador, Iraq, Afghanistan, and so many more. Compelled by how little our museums, exhibitions, universities, classrooms, and distributable books surveying the industry of art and culture truly picture and theoretically engage this brilliance in surviving today's socio-political upheavals and uneven social values, this is what commits me to my work. If I believe in building communities for contemporary culture, which I do, then I must understand that there can be no uniformity to this artistic production, in just the same way that we cannot expect humanity to operate culturally in the same way. What I would like to see our cultural worlds uh, operate is a celebrated awareness of what is not publicly visible in its labor, to acknowledge in our exhibitions, our buildings, our texts, our festivals, our theater and more, that many artists are also dealing with incredibly fragile social landscapes in politically prohibitive conditions. The negotiations we undertake to gain safe access to subject and people, the political relationships we must delicately maintain in order to keep our businesses registered, the private mentoring we personally nurture with emerging community, the lobbying we muster towards potential supportive donors, the emotional counseling we take on in order to encourage practice, the business partnerships we enter in the hope of sustainability, the educational access programs we devise in the hope of building criticality, and I could go on. And I don't think any of those instances are dissimilar to the architectural world. Again, such a catalogue might sound a given in a visibly culturally serviced and networked part of the world, such as Sweden. But here again, I must reiterate that undertaking such labor in disenfranchised contexts of political poverty teeters between legitimate and illegitimate action, between vague guidelines of official access and social expectation, between personal relationships of trust and obligation. If there is anything that I have learned from living this brilliant aesthesis of a decolonizing society, allowing my memories to be written by my senses instead of my sight. It is the resilience of cultural and spiritual ritual and its architectures, of the deep respect for social codes of conduct between the living and the dead. And to that end, I do hope that one day in Vietnam, we possess leaders who understand it is indeed better to live with ghosts that are culturally reconciled than ghosts that are multiplying in defiance. Thank you. Should we? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> I think. Um, I would like to start by, um, if you could get everybody get on their feet. And then uh, one fist up, and then we all shout three times, humanization, okay? Humanization, humanization, humanization. Thank you, you can uh, sit down. <laughs> um, I think um, I've been wondering, um, I've been very like uh, humbled by this, uh, humbled by this invitation because uh, I'm not an architect. I don't know much about uh, buildings, <laughs> um, but um, um, I do know something about trampoline house and I guess that's why I was invited. Um, and. Um, I think uh, I would like to talk about um, uh, something that we learned through the process of creating Trump and House, and it's about um, the culture of democracy and the, the reason why we kind of got on track um, of 
the culture of democracy is because we experienced uh, the asylum camps in Denmark, which are a gigantic experiment in how to deprive people of democracy. And if you study these places, uh, you will learn that it makes people sick. Uh, so if you convert back, you will realize that democracy is actually a really, really healthy praxis. If, if, you, if you understand and use democracy as a culture, uh, the people who, are, who practice it are healthy. So speaking of the camps, they use uh, drugs to control, uh, like psychoactive drugs to control uh, uh, asylum seekers. But actually, it's not the system. Uh, it's the system that's sick. It's not the people in the system. Um, and this is something that we uh, started working uh, uh, on uh, understanding uh, like um, 12 years ago. Um, um, so, um, like I said, we were never too concerned about the architecture um, because we were uh, looking for the social dynamics and how uh, the cultural habits, um, uh, ethnocracy, and uh, institutionalized inequality works on, uh, on people. Um, <clears throat> so, um, there's two, uh, it's a two-edged sword, this, um, uh, uh, um, the, the idea of depriving uh, people from democracy. Because on one hand, you have the people in the camps, they go sick. Uh, they have, um, I have a list here of the, of the uh, sufferings. If you live in, uh, in a Danish camp, you suffer from uh, isolation from the rest of society. You suffer from lack of uh, work permit. You suffer from infantilization. Uh, that's because uh, you do not have a work permit. So instead, in order to pretend that we uh, respect human rights, we give people pocket money. So uh, the grown-ups get pocket money and uh, the children, I don't know. I don't think they even, maybe the parents can give them some of their pocket money. Uh, then, uh, 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 because of that, you suffer from a general victimization. You th suffer from lack of decent health care, um, from a lack of, a lot of transparency in the power structure that controls you. And you uh, suffer from lack of personal agency and uh, lack of control of your own life. And you suffer from a systematic distrust from the immigration author authorities and the Refugee Appeals Board. Um, all this is um, about dehumanizing the individual. Uh, and you could say that uh, they are all effects of um, what Agamben called the state of exception. Maybe some of you know uh, his uh, trilogy. It's about, I think it's called Homo Saka. It's about uh, the, um, um, the state of exception, how uh, the uh, German Nazis managed to uh, completely dehumanize uh, the people they, they put into the camps, because uh, although they had a state with laws, they also established a territory inside the state, and inside that territory, there was a lack of the normal rules that citizen, citizens uh, uh, are subjected to. So in, in that way, uh, the state of exception allows the state to do whatever they want. And in the case of the concentration camps, it ended up with the gas chambers. Um, in, in, uh, in Denmark, we are not that. Uh, crazy. We uh, we aim for putting people on an airplane, uh, but uh, it's still the same uh, dynamics that is going on inside the camps. Um, uh, Franz Fanon has also uh, described this. Uh, he has this uh, term, um, the unbeings. Um, I think he used it for uh, people who live in the colonized world. Uh, but definitely the unbeings uh, are present in, uh, in the camps. Um, and then, of course, uh, we think that, okay, uh, in order to, uh, to enter the zone of the beings, uh, what 
what is required. Maybe you need a bank account, uh, a CPR number. That's like the first uh, steps of uh, entering into the zone of the beings. Um, but um, I think, uh, how far are we? Oh, I have uh, 33 minutes, that's good. <laughs> um, now, uh, like I mentioned, the camps, we saw it as, a, as an experimental site of uh, what, what does it, how do you completely destroy democracy uh, f for the people inside the camp. Um, the excuse that the Danish uh, government uses for this is that, uh, well, they crossed our borders. We, they don't belong here. They are not part of us. Uh, and it means that uh, they, don't, they didn't have any rights in the first place. So they should be happy that we respect their uh, bodily functions. We give them a roof, we give them food, we give them um, uh, like some health care, measured health care, and uh, we give them pocket money. So they should be happy. Um, but um, um, of course, the truth is that the inhabitants of the camps, they came because they fled an uh, unbearable situation in their home countries, but they also fled to, uh, towards, they were attracted by democracy, they were attracted by uh, human rights, they were attracted by freedom of speech, they were attracted by a lot of things that we have been, um, uh, uh, you know, the West has sold itself uh, on these, uh, uh, like on these headlines. Um, So, um, the question is for us in Trumpen House, the question is, can a state really call itself a democracy if it respects only the rights of the people who have the birthright to the territory, but not those who do not have the birthright to the territory? And what is it? I mean, there's something weird about this. Uh, like the camp itself is a territory and it has a border. A state has a border and a territory. And I would say that you know, any democracy needs a territory and a border in order to function, because you need to be able to set up rules, you need to have a constitution, you need to have like an area where you can define a certain culture that sustains um, uh, the, uh, the uh, democracy. Now, <clears throat> What is interesting is what happens on the border. In the Danish uh, system, uh, those who are on the border, and we don't, if we don't like them, we put them into camps. Um, is that a good idea? Well, we have been experimenting in Trampen House with a different um, uh, model. Uh, and that's why I'm here today to, uh, to discuss this, uh, this, uh, this model. Um, because the problem of the border is that it's really, really needed, but it's also highly problematic because it creates division. It creates uh, the possibility of uh, uh, you know, denouncing the other, naming the other, framing the other, um, and uh, it happens all the time. So, and even in Trampen House, this can happen very easily because you're, the stronger you are, local culture gets, and it needs to be strong in order to sustain the pressure from outside, then you also end up being exclusive. Suddenly, when people enter Trump in house, they're like, who are these people? They talk strange and they act strange, and you know, I don't know how to, how to be part of this because I have to act in certain ways. I don't understand the codes. I mean, all these, all these um, habits and routines that, that people in a culture understand, they are not understood by, by the people on the border or outside. So I think like my uh, learning from uh, working in Trampen House for so long is that it's really, really important how you negotiate the border. Um, and that's why um, I wanted to call um, this uh, uh, lecture Territory Border House. Uh, because, um, you know, uh, the house is actually the minimum requirement 
to sustain uh, the culture of democracy. Um, <clears throat> Now, um, when um, when we uh, uh, went to the camps and we did the analysis, uh, we did it by asking. Uh, the people who lived in the camps, how are we going to, uh, uh, like if, if we, uh, we, we, we want to understand the camp and uh, you need to teach us because you are our experts now. Uh, then um, uh, they started talking and while they were talking, we you know, took notes. In the end, we asked them, so what are we going to do about it? They told us we need uh, a house in Copenhagen. Um, because uh, we can't stand staying isolated in these camps. So we need a place where we can keep meeting. But it needs to be a place outside of this territory because this territory is killing us slowly. Um, and uh, uh, that's why uh, we ended up creating uh, Tramplin House. Um, sorry. Um, <clears throat> now, um, our claim is that um, uh, what they have created in Denmark and in the rest of the West is a democracies that only work for the majority. Um, the majority never realizes because it's like the upper middle class or lower middle class, they have a nice life. They don't understand that 10% of the population are excluded from this. Um, and uh, what we are saying is that if you study the methods of the camp, like Dick Agamben has described it, then you enter uh, or you end up with a situation which is unbearable for the people who are subjected to it. But actually, it is uh, a disease in the democracy itself, because if you start treating, um, if you start treating uh, 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 the minorities like this, then you end up creating routines that are based on lack of respect for um, the other, and these rut routines are actually what makes up the culture. Uh, democracy, I mean, culture is a set of routines. So it's really, really important how we, uh, like what kind of routines we allow ourselves to get used to. And in Denmark, um, our routines uh, are the routines of a tribal democracy, uh, which uh, excludes people of color. And as we go on, we're stumbling blindfolded into this gray zone between um, democracy and fascism. <clears throat> um, the state might still have a democratic constitution, but, uh, but uh, uh, the culture that sustains this uh, democratic constitution is under attack. <clears throat> um, so, in a way, we can count ourselves lucky with this gift of the camp, uh, although it's a gift you never want for your best friend, because it's a, it's a, all we had to do was to create a complete antidote. We had to, in the beginning, we just had to, okay, we'll do the exact opposite. Of course, when you start doing the exact opposite, you might end up uh, looking like your enemy. So uh, we realized at one point that we had to uh, start negotiating, because really uh, the, the democratic processes are uh, pragmatic. They are, it is a gray zone, and uh, like what, is, what looks right tomorrow uh, might, not, not, might not be right today. Uh, it's all in the uh, processes. I mean, if, if, a, uh, if, if we talk about uh, uh, the building, the house, um, 
it was also under constant development for 10 years because it needed to change according to the needs of uh, that uh, experiment. <coughs> um, yes, uh, so um, what does this have to do with, um, with uh, um, architecture? Uh, I'm, um, I'm not really sure. I have to say that uh, what, what I have been interested in for those uh, 12 years, uh, I didn't know to begin with, but I know now, it is uh, three different zones. The zone of the unbeings, which is the camp. Then the zone of the beings, which is um, the zone of the people with civil rights, uh, the rest of Denmark, the rest of Europe, the rest of Sweden. Um, and then it's the zone of becoming. Uh, and the zone of becoming, that's kind of, that's where, I, that's what I, I want to linger on a little because um, uh, the zone of becoming is actually what we try to, to create in Trampoline House. So what do you need? I don't, I can't talk about architecture, but I can talk about what do you need in order to uh, establish a zone of becoming. Um, and uh, you need to be able to ask questions all the time <laughs> to yourself. Uh, are we uh, on the right track? Um, you, uh, you have to ask yourself every day, what is the culture of democracy? You have to try to understand what does equality mean? How, do we, how does it happen? How can we actually um, uh, pursue equality? It's almost impossible. It's, it's, it is completely impos impossible to have equality between two people. <laughs> between, between three, it's even harder. But, but uh, at least you can try, and that's a, a very good uh, beginning. Uh, then um, uh, this uh, concept of solidarity is really important. Uh, you have to always uh, uh, pursue solidarity between peers, uh, and solidarity should sort of be in front of loyalty. Um, you, you, have, you are loyal to the state, you are loyal to the house, but so you have solidarity with your, uh, your compatriots, with your, with your colleagues, with your, uh, with your peers. Um, and uh, in a way, I, I think it should, the loyalty and the solidarity should actually be the same. <clears throat> then another very important part, no one is a victim. Uh, there should be no charity. You should never try to help anybody. You should always ask for help. And in terms of uh, a democracy, we practice democracy at house meetings, where we are sitting in uh, circles, um, exercising freedom of speech. Um, we try to confront internal uh, problems openly, and we uh, practice freedom of speech. I want to uh, talk a little about freedom of speech because that's really um, a crazy concept. Um, uh, so you also discuss uh, freedom of speech too a, a lot, which I really uh, loved. Uh, my uh, angle is uh, slightly different. If you're here in Sweden, maybe you remember Rasmus Paludan, the guy who burns Korans. He's actually exported from Denmark. <laughs> um, and uh, we are very happy to let you have him. <laughs> Uh, he is a guy who uh, uses the way uh, Denmark started to regard freedom of speech during the um, uh, cartoon crisis in 2004. Maybe somebody remember the cartoon crisis. It's a long time ago, but I still remember it. Um, it was um, a competition made by one of the big uh, right-wing papers. Uh, they asked um, all the Danish cartoonists to do uh, like a, um, a drawing of uh, Muhammad the prophet, and it, they wanted it to be sort of ironic or whatever, you know, like like a cartoon uh, for a newspaper. And uh, they wanted to do this because they wanted to test the Danish cartoonist's freedom of speech. 
because would they dare to do something that was controversial and who would upset the Muslims of the country? Uh, and then and when they put this uh, in the magazine, it was 12 cartoons. Um, they at the same on that day they also issued like a you know. Um, a story about why why we are putting these out, why we are printing them, and the idea was, if you want to live in this country, you have to uh, stand up to uh, you know bullying and uh, insulting uh, and you know all kinds of harassment because this is democracy. So it was schoolyard bullying at a grand scale, and. What happened, if you remember, was that the Jyllands Posten, the magazine, they, they forgot that we had become part of the world uh, since uh, last century. So suddenly they were um, faced with a global outcry because the whole Muslim world was like really going crazy. And they were burning embassies and burning Danish flags all over the place. Um, and uh, even uh, George Bush, uh, the, for, the early George Bush, I think, he came out and said, well, we don't think in America that uh, this is how you exercise freedom of speech. <laughs> it's the first time I ever was ag agreed with that guy, you know. <laughs> um, but um, um, it was um, a crazy time because I was, at, at that time, I was working with um, socially engaged art meaning that I would go to some uh, suburb, some social housing project, uh, propose uh, some kind of social process with the uh, citizen who, people who live there, and it would probably be funded by uh, a municipality. And then this art project would generate some kind of agency uh, and, and, or you know, political discourse, uh, with, and that was the artwork. But after the Mohammed crisis, it was impossible to have meaningful conversations in, in the Danish public because everybody had um, voided the middle ground. I mean, in order to have a communication, in order to have a, a, you know, a, a sensible discussion, you need to be able to approach each other and, and, and speak respectfully to each other. But when you, uh, when you decide that freedom of speech means to be as extreme as possible, because you need to prove that you can insult this other person, then people, people are gravitating towards the edges. <laughs> and they forget about what's going on in this, in this uh, common ground. And you actually, you, I don't think you can have a, a true a meaningful conversation if you don't dare to step into the common ground. Um, so what happened was that I was kind of deprived of the canvas that I used to do my artwork. Like the so these social processes were, uh, it didn't happen. It couldn't happen. That's another reason why we need a trampoline house. Because as we started, as we rebooted, or sorry, as we started up trampoline house, we had these principles, um, you know, uh, uh, unconditional mutual respect. That was actually our one and only rule in the very first house. Uh, and it was um, very controversial in Denmark because at that time, no, 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 we shouldn't respect each other. We should uh, prove that we can insult each other. You know? and, and what they were actually trying to achieve was like the first step or the last step before a, before a civil war. Um, I don't think that's a good way to have a conversation in a society. So for us, it was really important to reboot the public discourse. And the only way we could do it was to open up a house defined by four walls, at least, and then start defining the rules inside. From then on, we could open up a discourse with a different kind of a, of a a feeling where people wouldn't have to argue and be insulted or, you know, it would be based on trust, it would be based on solidarity, it would be based on love, and uh, it would be based on common sense. Um, <clears throat> so, um, freedom, freedom of speech uh, for us is not, I mean, it's something that you really um, it's, 
is crucial, like you have just uh, demonstrated. It's absolutely crucial, crucial to any democracy or any other society. But um, you can actually destroy it. A guy like uh, Rasmus Paludan, fortunately, he's the last crusader. <laughs> Uh, and uh, many of the extreme right-wing people, they have actually, they've kind of realized that, okay, maybe it was too much. Maybe we need to start talking to each other in a different way. I've noticed that I was in a debate uh, a week ago, and one of these re really hardliners from the extreme right-wing, like she's a priest, uh, Danish, uh, uh, Danish priest who's like really uh, angry about uh, refugees and, you know, um, but, but even she admitted that um, it, can get, it can get too much with this freedom of speech. Uh, so there's something about responsibility and, free, and freedom of speech which is important. And that's, then we are, we are back to uh, that the democracy is a pragmatic process and it's, it's probably going wrong most of the time. Uh, it went wrong uh, many times in Trumpton House. It still goes wrong in the House. But if there's enough transparency, if people tend to believe that we are actually doing our best and we try to do our best together, then there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, people will, uh, will uh, forgive the mistakes. Uh, and then uh, I think also another, another um, way of describing uh, Trumpton House is, we have this uh, slogan, it's called My House, Your House. And it's based on this idea of a, a home. And what is a home if you come from 25 different cultures? How do you, how do you, um, I mean, how do you, uh, what, what does it look like in your home? And what does it look like in your home? And so on, you know? So in this way, the Trumpton House should be a place where everybody can come and put a piece of furniture or a gadget or, you know, some kind of, you know, a plant. So everybody can um, uh, become a part of a, or, you know, everybody can help build a common home. Um, and this maybe turns into a kind of a family feeling. Family is a dangerous word because in most of the world, uh, that if there's a family, there's also a patriarch. <laughs> but but uh, this, is, uh, this is the name of the game, you know. Um, and uh, uh, then we have to take it to the house meeting and discuss how, uh, how uh, these power structures are going. Um, now, uh, Trumpet House as a learning site is also a super important part because uh, we, if we talk about becoming, then uh, to learn is really important. Uh, and this is very, it's, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to be too hard, it's not like too philosophical, it's about learning languages, uh, but it's also about uh, having creative workshops, doing job training, uh, CV workshops, you know, helping people to get out uh, in society, uh, making it easier to find a job, things like that. Um, so uh, these, uh, these uh, things are important. <coughs> um. <coughs> now, um, We know that um, that uh, this culture that I've been trying to describe is dependent on these borders, uh, but it it's also really important that it stays open to newcomers and it stays open to uh, new ideas, um, and that's kind of it's a hard part of like what is democracy. Um, Uh, because uh, our live culture, it really changes every day, like language changes every day. Uh, now, so the question is, what, what kind of uh, architecture can support this? <laughs> and that's basically what I need to ask you about. <laughs> because... Uh, I don't know. I mean, I have a. I'm. I'm thinking a, a parliamentary building sustains democracy. Uh, I mean, everybody knows that because uh, politicians go in there, they make decisions, and you know. So it's it's a very important part of a democracy. Um, 
any square in the city also sustains democracy because you can have a demonstration. Um, but in both, in both these two uh, architectural sites, there's kind of there's an assignment of what the citizen will do when you enter this place. A politician will act in a certain way in the parliament. And they even, I mean, in the Danish parliament, they have rules about how to address each other, uh, which I think is very good because it's part of creating a culture of respect. So they, they use uh, like these uh, pronouns that we never use anymore in the, in, in the rest of Denmark. Uh, you know, it's like uh, entitling each other in a very uh, polite way. Um, and if you go to the square and you have a demonstration, there's a certain way uh, activists look like, there's a certain way they act. So we all get to play these roles that are pre-assigned in these different uh, places. And that's why I think it's interesting to uh, think about what if it was possible to create, well, now I tried to create a house for 12 years, and I think we managed to, uh, to create a situation where people are actually able to learn and to grow and to, and to uh, allow a democracy that's working in between them. Um, but I don't know how much the building actually affects on this, but I do know that when we, um, when we, uh, did the, um, the first, um, or when we had the big house, the biggest version of Trampton House, you saw uh, the, uh, uh, what's it called, like the, the, the floor plan of this place. Uh, most of these rooms, or half of these rooms, we actually built ourselves. And whenever we decided to build a room because we needed a new activity, we always knew that we can't just design it the way we designed it last time. And the reason was that this cannot look like an institution. We can't have the, uh, the Danish designer lamps, you know, uh, uh, Arne Jacobsen, uh, like these, these uh, icon, iconic lamps uh, or, you know, pendles that are all over in the Danish institutions because they look so much like, like the culture that controls us. <laughs> So we need, we need to, uh, when we build Trampton House, we need to uh, you know, come up with new ways, ask a new guy to come in and just tell him, we need the walls, they need to be here and here, but you decide, you know? And then he builds something really weird, and it's beautiful, because it shows plurality. Um, so in a way, uh, you could say that, uh, uh, it, it's a little like uh, the, the Lunds Cathedral, you know, this uh, church that uh, is completely a mess because it's like, I don't know how many different times of uh, like um, uh, different uh, um, architectural styles that is actually present in that building. Um, and I think that uh, one of the most important parts of this is that you can never have a finished design. Um, we have to be able to con for anyone to contribute. We, uh, we, we have to avoid a singular guiding principle or style, except the one that says it has to be useful. <laughs> there has to be a reason b behind it. And I, you know, I, I, that's also something that you can realize. You know, at one time we built a, a kindergarten room, which turned out to be way too small. And we had these goofy windows, uh, and then uh, we had to move the kindergarten to a, another part. And, and suddenly it was like, what, is, what are we going to use? We started using it as uh, an office, and it just, it was weird because it had lost its purpose. And if we, if we had built it as an office space, we would have built bigger windows. Uh, so that's like these things that are important, like uh, a form follows function, <laughs> I guess. It's a, it's a, uh, and then, of course, uh, economy is uh, always the biggest one. Um, but I, you know, I think it's a very important one, but uh, it's not the most important one, because uh, uh, you can always work with anything uh, if the heart is there. 
and if people understand that that uh, uh, that our hearts are in this. So the plan is not to have a plan and to destroy any uh, hegemony of uh, aesthetics, and uh, it's to. Uh, to allow anyone to contribute and add items from different cultural backgrounds. And it is to uh, become full of memories. And it is to always have extra space for new memories, which might mean that it has to be bigger and bigger. <laughs> but um, I mean, all this, because democracy is never finished. It has to leave room for participation. It has to be a live process. Um, and this to sustain a culture that uh, should allow people to become, to achieve their higher potential. A, de a democratic architecture, and now I'm kind of, you know, this is your, I actually, I'm not saying this, I'm, I'm suggesting <laughs> that a democratic architecture, in my uh, view, uh, should be unfinished. It is itself uh, in the process of becoming, in order to allow its, its users to create and be inside the zone of becoming. Um, yeah, that's actually uh, the end of it. <laughs> Thank you. Before going uh, where we are going, I want to bring you a little bit two things. First of all, I mean, I am a Lisa Meitner uh, professor here in, in uh, Lund, and once we were sitting and they were um, being all women, of course, they were questioning gender in, uh, in the university, how we make balances between uh, gender. And, and my take on this was, you know, if we will keep writing the CV the same way, pretending only to bring women inside that same CV and that same evaluation system, we will never arrive to a sort of really uh, gender equality in that sense. I would like to begin to see a CV that actually writes all the activities that we are doing during our day. So if we got to go to pick up our kids from their kindergartens and from their schools, this is part of our CV in somehow, because we are participating in the society, we are participating that the society will be actually growing. And I would see that if this would become a value in the CVs, then I think that we will have the opposite thing where men and women would fight who is going to get their kids from the kindergarten rather than the other way around. And I was actually uh, asking, can we go radical? Can we really make a gender balance? And, and to make a gender balance means to open up the system, to accept that there are different houses in the system, there are different ways of thinking, evaluating, analyzing, and, and actually we can share that cultures and exchange them so it would become pluricultural. And it's not that we have to be all invited in one culture, and yet, this is why I promise myself, and I will explain a little bit more why, it's never to accept to be included in the system. Actually, I am I'm happy to be included the moment I am a guest. In Arabic, we say a guest, uh, I mean, I will say it first in Arabic, that means hospitality is for three days, and after that, it's a charity. Right, so if we will understand hospitality as a temporary manner, I don't want to be a guest after three days. So in some way, as I begin to actually spend more than three days in this university, I also would like to act as a host. And therefore, I, this, is, this is the promise. Now, we, we speak about how we gain agencies in, in our life. I promise myself to always set the ground for me to also be able to host, right? So, I mean, I am now getting you to be hosted by me in the living room that we created in uh, the university. And I will end up by 
you know, I mean, in some way, I, I really love, I, I think that Morton and Zoe make it so easy for me in some way to actually get you in, in, in that sense, because we will be discussing a lot, but in somehow, you know, just a hint on what house mean in Arabic. We normally in Arabic, we have different ways of saying many, you know, of, of saying one about one thing. There are also many different origins. And in Arabic, we have one of the house where is the place where you sleep in. But another way of expressing house, which is dar, which is actually the name of our practice, by the way. And dar means to actively make a, go, go like this around yourself and create a circle for yourself. And that circle is maybe the border that Martin was speaking about. It's not, borders are not only national borders. They can be a way of saying, you know, now you will leave your circle. And that doesn't mean that, you know, creating knowledge in certain ways, thinking design in certain ways are, are not very important. But for me, a real democracy is the one that has so many circles rather than the one that want everybody to fit in one big circle, because then we will end up by it being only democracy for the majority. In order for it to be a real transformative democracy, we all need to be able in the becoming to draw a little bit of our own house wherever we go. And therefore, you are all invited in this moment to follow me in my house and to be hosted by me in there. Yeah, and now I would like to say thank you for the for the for the lectures before we move over to the to the next phase of the symposium. And we will be thanking them after yes. actually the questions, sorry for that, the questions and the answers would be taken we, exactly placed there. there. So yeah. we will continue all what happened. So don't leave us. Please accept join us. to be guests and, and come to join me and and yeah, yeah, we, 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 we it's in the A building. Oh. Okay, yes. So, uh, it's in the A building. It's uh, the um, um, Utställningshallen in the architecture building that we are heading towards. <laughs> <laughs>